All right, so these are the two resources. So, because so, most people, they'll say, well, veganism is, they'll invoke sentience, they'll invoke other things. So veganism, defined by the vegan society in 1951. So originally, so these are the people who have to define veganism. They're the ones who created the term. The word veganism shall mean the doctrine that man shall live without exploiting animals. Should so live. that's that's the running definition. Yeah, yeah, or shall, yeah should live without exploiting animals. Mm -hmm. So uh, once you have that definition, then you can actually uh, go from there. So the common arguments that I find that are insufficient from veganism is the sentience argument. Because if you're going to invoke sentience, then you also have to, you, the counter arguments to that will be, what about abortion? What about mentally handicapped people? What about alive babies that are mentally deficient, right? You start opening up a whole realm of other questionable things. Well, where do you draw the line? What about muscles? What about insects? Um, and you start to, uh, so muscles being the, the sea oyster, um, the, yeah, the oyster or the mussel, mm -hmm. depending on which country you're in. Um, yeah, so then you get into murky territory and it's just hard because it's not particularly practical. Whereas if you uh, do, yeah, the word veganism shall mean the doctrine of man shall live without exploiting animals. The focus here is on animal and exploitation. Um, so you can actually avoid um, uh, the sentience argument directly by just saying all oh, animals and then you consider what exploitation is. Um, so in this argument, I end up uh, talking about how the goal uh, of veganism or the, the of veganism is to actually avoid unnecessary um, violations of animals or of an animal's will. Um, so there's ones that you can avoid uh, or ones that, uh, yeah. So, so for instance, uh, it's been a few years since I wrote this article, but that's, that's the most coherent thinking I have on the subject there. But it raises like an issue of um, I, most veganisms, if they're, so there's, there's categories of three arguments. Uh, let me evoke the, the Google, uh, doc, sorry, this GitHub document. Mm -hmm. So I've got this one. So this is when I went vegan first year. I'm updating this with every argument that I was finding and every single resource. Um, so this is a link of all the resources that converted me to veganism and all the arguments that I found that converted me. Because when you go vegan, everyone is questioning you. So you have to answer them, uh, you know, with enough justification that you can actually justify this radical change in your way of being. Um, so I've got it divided into initiation, ecology, ethical health, then frequently asked questions, too long, didn't read, and resources. Um, so the ecology, ethical, and health, they're going to be the main three areas which uh, the vegan arguments fall under. One is environmental. Um, mm. You know, you should do vegan to save the planet. The other one is ethical. You should do vegan to save the animals. The other one is health. You should do vegan because it's it saves you from disease, um, which is kind of the religious aspect right it's, it's all about saving you know, saving someone else um whereas for me i i actually initially i really cared about the ethical side where now it's purely selfish uh for the reasons just like any objectivist i do it because it's consistent mm. um i don't particularly engage in you know evangelism unless it arises mm. just because i don't care anymore i just care about living consistently in myself so, so for instance, if you care about environment and you actually care about ethics, then if those are the real, so for most people, when they go vegan, it's going to be an emotional thing um, or a health thing. There's going to be some life circumstances that severely challenge them. And those are the things that maybe have pushed them over to veganism. So most people in their first or second years of vegan, they're very raw emotionally with the conversion and they haven't really particularly thought through the arguments that well. Um, so that's going to be at the areas where you can seek your team to and, and really, uh, you know, attack, attack them. If you were more sociopathic, uh, to attack <laughs> where? that's where they're going to be. Well, just attack their psyche on it. 
because that's when they'll be most vulnerable in those first few years. Uh, so for instance, uh, someone could have watched Earthlings uh, and they see the five ways which animals are abused in modern mm. society uh, or used as slaves in modern society. Um, uh, those being uh, clothing, medical research, food, uh, um, and then there was two others. Uh, I think food, medical re oh one was cosmetics uh what's the last one i can't remember what the last one was but the medical research one is absolutely horrific like it you think the food one is horrific the medical research one oh my god like they have monkeys and they're just like destroying these monkeys like it's kind of that you know peterson goes into um the Japanese camp where they tortured humans, like burn off the limbs and gave them things. Yeah. That that's what we're doing every day to monkeys and rats and everything. <laughs> it's crazy for for the progress of science, right? Okay, so if someone's saying, uh, yeah, going to vote ecology or they're going to vote ethics, uh, then you can just raise like the immediate counter argument to them that can severely. Uh, detract from their position is going to be the nomads of Mongolia or Papua New Guinea, which is that, say, in the Mongolia uh, situation, the entire ecology is humans, grass, horses, and wolves. That's it. They're, they're, there's no plants. There's no possibility to grow plants. It's just grass, like, because it's thousands of kilometers of rocky terrain with grass in, like, 10 degrees to zero degrees to negative degrees of temperature. There isn't any capacity to grow uh, plants there. So you only have grass, wolves, horses, and humans. So this is where the domestication of horses happened 40,000 years ago. This is the first domestication event of an animal. Um, so what happened is the humans and the horses formed an allegiance against the wolves the humans would protect the horses from the wolves and exchange the horses would trust the humans. Now the humans would, it doesn't make sense for the humans to just go crazy and eat all the horses or even eat the best horses. They eat the sickest and most downtrodden horse because the better the horses do, then the more sustainable the situation is. Now this way of life, while it's not particularly healthy, it is the most ecological as well as the most ethical way of life one can live compared to a Western person. Because in the Western world, we're constantly destroying everything. We're having severe ecological impacts. We're having severe ethical impacts. Like if I order, uh, if I eat wheat, then on like 1,000 kilometers, you kill probably like, I think, 100 rats when it's harvested. Sorry, one kilometer, yeah, you kill probably like 100 rats while it's being harvested. Um, so there's a lot of side effect uh, killing as well as just in general, you know, we have to mine things from the ground. We have to displace other animals, you know, in the name of progress, we do a lot of uh, victimization. And so the thing is, if someone was an absolutist over ecology and ethics, like if they took their arguments completely seriously, and those were the two principles they really cared about, then they should be a nomad in Mongolia or in Papua New Guinea where the ecology is jungle, potatoes, humans, and pigs. So the humans, they eat pigs and potatoes. Um, and again, that's going to be causing less animals killed, less suffering than what, you know, ordering anything from the supermarket does. At least that's the, the high-level theory. If they took it seriously, then how... Because that's the other thing. If they're saying these things are wrong, then it should be wrong universally across all of Australia. I mean, across all of the world. Like, if killing animals is wrong, it needs to be wrong everywhere, even for the nomad, even for the the hunter, the hunter gatherer. Right. So obviously, it can't be wrong everywhere because otherwise, we then say all the circumstances of our past are immoral, and you know they should have all just starved to death or had malnutrition, which isn't viable. And obviously we still live in the first world. So there must be something beyond that. So that's again, where the vegan society definition kicks in, which is about the exploitation of animals. 
So there's something very different with the situation in Mongolia, as well as the situation in Papua New Guinea, which is that about exploitation and also about necessity, which is these tribes uh, have no other capacity to live. It is a necessary violation when they kill that animal. And we then see this uh, embedded in religion. So for instance, in Muslim uh, religion, they say the prayer before they slit the animal's throat. It goes something, the translation is something like, uh, thank you God for saving my life in exchange for this animals. That's essentially the symbolic gesture of the thing. So there's the idea that this is a, a sin or this is a, a violation, but it's accepted. It, the, the trade there is accepted. But then when you have a Muslim on an airplane asking if the steak that they're receiving on the airplane meal is kosher, it's hardly about saving uh, the life at 40,000 feet in the air. It is then definitely more about wealth and about um, uh, preference rather than about necessity and starvation. So over time, uh, we've moved away from the necessity to hurt and violate animals into now where it's optional. If you live in a supermarket society, uh, um, then you can get supplements as well as plants that can provide for you nutritionally. And you, so you avoid now the necessity of this violation. And then once you go from there, then it doesn't matter then whether, you know, you're focusing on the horrors of factory farming. It just makes it, well, it's unnecessary then to participate in animals um, for your diet. Unless, of course, you are in a culture like being a digital nomad, I travel a lot. And there'll be times when it is necessary uh, to consume. So if I was to go to, you know, Mongolia, then eating plants is not going to be viable. Same with the Himalayas. Uh, same if I was going to Papua New Guinea. Same if I was going to some areas in the Philippines. If I was going to... So in the Philippines, they're so impoverished um, that they will slaughter pigs um, for people's birthdays. And the reason why is because in those rural areas, the diet is pretty much rice and a few, and like maybe some soybeans um, and then some other herbs that they found. So once a year, they get to avoid hunger by consuming a pig with their family. And it's quite a blessing in that sense. And it's also similar to uh, rural Bali. So on a ceremony, um, like a celebration, be it a graduation ceremony, sometimes on birthdays, they will slaughter a chicken um, primarily to, so they'll, what they'll do is it's a big ceremony. So what they'll do is they'll bless the chicken and tell the chicken in the afterlife to communicate to the spirits to bless the family. And by the chicken being consumed that way, the chicken is also blessed. So, so then they slaughter the chicken and then by consuming the chicken's flesh, then they're passing over the blessing of the family. And so there's certain instances where I have consumed animals since going vegan. And one is in Bali during one of these celebrations, I consumed chicken because if you were to turn down uh, the chicken in these celebrations, you're essentially cursing the family. And that's doing far more harm to a human animal, uh, to several human animals than it is doing to the already dead chicken. And it would be the same if I was going through Mongolia, which is one has to then say, is the harm impacting humans or myself more severe than the harm of uh, killing an animal? Mm -hmm. So once we've got that framework done, uh, then we can then focus on the superfluous or, or, or peripheral arguments of factory farming and environment. Uh, all of those are unnecessary to the foundation of veganism. They're just, you know, very strong points that kind of get people to initially in, like go into the veganism uh, uh, mindset. 
because hopefully most people know the horrors of medical research and factory farming. Uh, maybe not consciously, probably subconsciously, because they like to push it like <laughs> to the to the peripheries of the consciousness because it's just so extreme. Um, uh, the horrors there. The same for the environmental aspect. The, I, there's a series of studies kept the movie Cowspiracy. I goes into the research quite intensely. They also have the research published on their website. Um, and it's it, the majority of carbon emissions, oh, sorry, not, not carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, emissions, so they include yeah. methane, yeah, uh, is coming from the animal agriculture industry. Um, and there's, there's more on that, like the amount of water is needed to make a hamburger versus, um, you know, eating a mushroom, which are fairly equivalent, like a portobello mushroom, uh, are quite poor. poor. Oh, yeah, I think it's to get the same amount of nutrition from a hamburger compared to plants is, is way higher as well as the water consumed, the resources consumed. So then you get into all the environmental stuff. But to me, that's that's all oh yeah peripheral information it's not particularly necessary to the vegan argument gotcha. all right yeah there's a lot there uh, let me see if i can pinpoint some of the particular things that i wanted to go into so it seemed like uh, understanding kind of the the i guess the principle of veganism is that um we we shouldn't we we should at attempt to live without exploiting the animals like where we have the capacity or the capability to not uh, exploit animals, then we should do that I instead. Um, I, I, do you have a, like a kind of understanding of like what what is usually meant by exploit there? Is it just like using their, I don't know, uh, you, using their bodies uh, for your own purposes? Is that just is what is meant by exploit? Yeah. Well, exploitation would be uh, non-consensual. So this is one of the things which is, because uh, it, it, it's also going off the, uh, the framework of abolitionism. So a lot of the early abolitionists who were against slavery uh, were also vegans, um, or at least had a, a orientation towards that. Um, to avoid unnecessary harm, and, and and so it makes so from my perspective, this is also when I told you that objectivism and libertarianism and veganism go hand in hand, which is you can't have one without really the other because if you're going to then say that you know we have to respect individual rights of humans, mm -hmm. um, then why not expect the right and the will of other animals as well, because we have to also acknowledge that humans are an animal. Um, we're the human animal, and but colloquially, uh, animal is referring to non-human animal. Um, so, so in terms of like violation, uh, so there's actually arguments for bestiality, which is interesting, as horrendous as that topic is. Uh, that sometimes bestiality is appears to be consensual between the animal and the uh, human, which is very disturbing <laughs> and also raises an issue of whether or not an animal can actually consent, <laughs> of whether it has the intelligence to, right? But clearly, out of two responses, which is enjoyment and fear or terror, right, then there's going to be a... Uh, you know, if we if we put consent on the enjoyment spectrum and then non-consent on the terror spectrum, uh, we can kind of have a good measure of those two things. Uh, so when it comes to, so one of the tricky ones which can catch vegans up is bees, right? Because bees are an insect and you manifest honey. Uh, so essentially it's slave labor. You're taking the work from bees and you're stealing it. Um, and that work is their food supply for the winter. So by taking the honey, you're taking the work because food, bees, if they have enough honey, they work less. 
Um, so by taking the honey, you're forcing them to work more. It's, it's kind of like a little uh, slave camp. So <laughs> is, is, it that, is it that because uh, animals cannot like verbally or uh, intentionally consent to how we're treating them that we like don't have an access to using them as like property in, in certain ways? Um, do you think yeah. that? What or, is it? No, no, go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, so for bee, so that's the one which comes from bee. Well, there's, bees is actually complex. So for each of the individual points here, there's GitHub notes. I goes into every single one. So there's a whole section there on bees and honey. Um, but for bees, it's the majority of bee producers will swap out the honey for sugar water. And that offers less nutrition towards the bees. And, and or they will just kill the bees when it comes winter time. Uh, and then they'll reset up a bee colony in the summer. Now the, the honey producers, so there's actually a movie called Leave No Trace and they talk about a honey producer and that. Um, so there is times where honey seems to be a mutual relationship between the beekeeper and the bees in the same way between the horses and the, um, the Mongols. Uh, the nomadic Mongols. What so makes it does a mutual seem to be... it, it, Are the bees like expressing some semblance of consent with their owners? That's correct. There doesn't seem to be any evidence of fear or terror uh, mm -hmm. in that relationship. I see. Um, it's, it's similar to the Mongols going after the weakest horse because the horses uh, kind of submit to the Mongols in this situation because they've understood the trade-off. It's very similar to uh, African animals being consumed by a lion. Um, there seems to be some understanding with the, uh, the animals there of the way of life. <laughs> uh, sometimes it seems like once you've lost the battle, like if you're the weakest horse or the weakest zebra, I mean, in Africa, then it seems like at some point they're just like, oh, well, this is the circle of life. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I was kind of wanting to ask you. If you thought that it is immoral, like when a lion yeah. requiring food kills the weakest zebra or the, the lone straggling yeah. zebra or the gazelle. Yeah. Yeah. You think yeah, it, so there's it, definitely a violation. Okay. So, so this is the thing. So, so this is this long article that I go into. So one of the big hangups over veganism is people want to maintain the perception that they were pure and that they are innocent and that they haven't harbored wrongdoing. Um, because the move to veganism is a conceptual and emotive, uh, kind of like, you know, a Christian being born again. It's a similar type of thing where you have to then acknowledge for the past 20 plus years of your life, you're an adult, uh, you've been doing horrific, horrendous things to animals against their consent. Like, like to maintain your food, you ha have been paying people to torture and abuse and enslave and to murder. Well, not murder, to kill animals. Um, and it is, you have to overcome that. You actually have to admit that you uh, were guilty of doing those, those wrongdoings. And then you can actually then focus on the next bit. So there's a huge moral uh, 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 change in oneself. But in mo and this seems to be the issue of why vegetarians never go, uh, why many vegetarians never actually make it to veganism because, and especially women, um, uh, it seems um, some more weak-willed uh, women stay in vegetarianism because they don't wish to harbor within themselves the acceptance that they were doing horrendous, horrific things. Um, so it's easy for them to have this uh, ig ignorance towards uh, that suffering rather than actually accepting that they were behind the suffering. Uh, or that their actions cause that suffering. Uh, so, um, so the, yeah, so, so, so the article then says, you know, to go into, so those things, so the, the article says violations are inevitable. Either way, you're going to be violating other people's will. Um, the only thing that is important 
whether or not it was necessary or not. And if it was necessary, then you should seek to make it avoidable in the future. You should seek to eventually make it unnecessary. And that's where moral progress comes from. We see horrendous things and we decide this should no longer be necessary and then we embark on an endeavor to make it unnecessary. Um, so for instance, that, uh, so I talk about we should make necessary violations avoidable. So that would be if I'm a vegan and I'm traveling, I should prepare vegan, uh, you know, I should bring meal replacements, like vegan meal replacements, powdered uh, vegan meal replacements as emergency. So I don't have the necessity to kill an animal uh, for, for my meal. Uh, so, you know, if you go traveling as a vegan, you have to, you could either just go willy nilly and then you would end up being malnutritioned and have to engage in eating animals or you can go prepared. But if you're going to go from, you know, travel in Mongolia, you would have to bring a hell of a lot of um, vegan meal replacements uh, on your trip, as well as uh, the question of whether or not those vegan meal replacements in that type of organic situation is superior to just eating the horses is questionable. Um, so that's where, where you kind of, you know, get a more it's easier to then not beat yourself up anymore. Like a lot of vegans um, may revert back out of veganism in those first few years because they can't um, deal with these intricacies consistently. They may be like, you know, in those situations, they don't find a way of rectifying it. But, you know, if you've tried your best, you try to avoid the necessity of harming animals. That's all one can ask for of you. But the, yeah, so, so this idea of this violation, so most people are quite black and white thinkers. They can't have the idea that it's okay to actually violate things. It's okay to actually sin if that sin was necessary. Um, uh, and that's also what that Muslim prayer is about, which is, you know, people, the, the Muslims recognize like many uh, ancient religions that, you know, an animal expressing fear and terror is undesirable and something is wrong. However, it is necessary. So they build up a way to resolve the cognitive dissonance. They build a prayer to acknowledge and overcome the cognitive dissonance there. So I, I guess kind of my question is like, do animals like simply by their existence have the right to not die or not to be killed? Um, either by humans killing them or, or from uh, animals. Well, so, so this is one of the things, right? Like, like it's, if we're going to say like a, a woman has a right to not be raped, which uh, then we're saying that any instance of rape is, is, is evil. We, we're specifically evoking the term evil here mm -hmm. rather than just a, a wrongdoing, right? So, so for an animal, if they were to say have the right to not be killed, then that's something that is then saying, even if it's necessary, it was evil. And this is just incorrect. Uh, then all carnivores would be obliterated off the earth for being evildoers. Um, we would kill the lions. We would kill the fish because they're evil. So you think um, it, so it is necessary for a carnivore to kill? Or yeah. like, so the carnivore yeah, that, that, by its existence has kind of the, I guess, allowance to kill another animal because of yeah. the nature of what it is. Okay. Yeah, but so this is an area which there is contention within vegan circles. Mostly it seems between guys and women about cats. Cats are cute. So they exploit the, uh, you know, evolutionary, the cuteness is de designed to exploit the generosity of other species that have a, is it Newtonic? Newfinic? Uh, 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 yeah, and I know what you're referring to. It neo uh, neotenic. Is it, is it neo but how do you pronounce it? Oh, neotenous, right? Yeah, neotenous. Neotenous, yeah, yeah, neoteny. So it's it like it is evolutionally designed to exploit neoteny in other species. Like it is like that's the thing. Evolution is exploitive. 
that's that's uh but you know women that get exploited by that and like oh it's a cute little cat oh it's meowing uh and they harbor the cat and the cat is a carnivore it cannot uh so in present day it cannot go vegan because we do not have any vegan supplements uh like say lab grown meat uh for it um so instead we kill a hundred fish a year to provide for this cat so one cat is a hundred other lives killed and this is uh this to me is absolutely insane and i think this is why many uh women prefer to stay vegetarian than vegan because otherwise they have to do these trade-offs um and also the cat is a domesticated animal from 2000 years ago uh very early uh which is it was domesticated on farms to kill uh mice it was never domesticated for apartment homes or the modern day home it was specifically for farms to kill mice that relationship is no longer around that's why we now have to provide the the, the killing for the for the cat instead right and oh, it is it so is it's insane. just just kind of thinking like since it is the case that animals are going to die, so like take it out, out out in the wild where a gazelle, like it, it is just a fact that even if it has the right to not die or not to be killed, that is a right that will go unfulfilled just based off of like even li living of old age or uh, by its own accident, something like that. Then is it kind of a... I don't know, a, a misapplication of a, a right onto the animal if it's a right that actually can't be fulfilled. So like, I, I think that rights are something that can be like granted. So like we mentioned rape, where I, I think it's kind of like a social contract or not a social contract, a social con construct where people within a community, they agree upon a certain set of rules for how they should treat each other within the community. And then anybody that breaks those right. rules is like breaking the, the contract and right. punished for it. And so that's where I think that like, yeah. it is possible to live in a community and not be raped if, it, if it's within a community that accepts that they're not going to rape. Now, I don't think that same right. right, like right to life can be had, say if you're living out in the wild. So what, what's the uh, grizzly man, his name? Uh, I, I don't think he ha necessarily has the right to life because he's existing within the uh, a, a, a group of grizzly bears that can't accept that that uh, right. that agreement yeah. between each other. Yeah, yeah. So for rights, there's two two categories of it. One is natural rights, so inalienable rights. Uh, these are your God-given rights, and the other one is legislative rights. Um, and but a right seems to be something that is granted to you. It is a privilege that you have that others must submit to. It is power over others. Um, so, for instance, the right not to be raped is the power that other people cannot rape you. So other people and must submit to you. Yeah, and that's a, power that's, uh, that's a power that is supported by, say, a legal system or even not, e not yeah. even in situations without a legal system like family uh, patriarchal support or that for within that community. Yeah. Yeah. Now, but yeah, so I guess... even for God given rights, like I, I'm not so sure you could say that animals have a God given right not to be killed because they are going to die inevitably due to the nature of existence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think, so there's, you know, there's, uh, in the long medium post, they go into the difference between the animal welfare camp, which is more vegetarianism, and then the animal rights camp, which is more uh, veganism. However, the rights thing I still take issue with. I like being, I, I think, probably in a similar way where a Christian perceived rights as God-given rather than man-made. Uh, I kind of just view rights as... as faulty because it's just about a social construct and like any social construct it can be violated it's just about the willingness of the participant so it's kind of like stating what the ideal is and then requesting people play along with the ideal 
it, it's not anything that is um, in a level. So, so, but the, well, the distinguishment there like... between welfare and rights is, it, yeah. Yeah, well, I, yeah, yeah, let me just go into this okay. and then so the difference between why vegetarians lean on welfare and veganism uh, leans on the rights arguments is because just for the political objectives. Uh, so the welfare is about improving the life of, let's say, the dairy cow un until they are or not even the dairy cow, the, the meat cow mm -hmm. until they are slaughtered. So, you know, making sure that they have a life of well-being until they are forcefully killed. And then the, um, the rights argument, which is then to try and use the, the framework of legal rights for humans to then say, well, no, because so the rights argument is actually approaching it from slavery and murder. So, so murder is illegal killing. So killing an animal, uh, Killing a monkey, it seems, is never okay because we have conventions regarding monkeys. Mm -hmm. By killing a chicken, it doesn't really matter. Um, so, so they're trying to then invoke well, the same type of rights that humans cer certain times but where, where again, killing a chicken it yeah. does matter. Like if it's somebody else's chicken, then you that you're that's a right. violation of a person's property rights. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is where I think the the rights argument is silly because it forgoes the necessity, right? If we're then saying it's, um, you, you know, that all animals have the right to not be killed, uh, well, it, it sort of, I guess it depends on your framework of rights, which is also, I guess, what a jury uh, should distinguish, which is, like, say, for instance, the, the government, right? Like, the government murders people, well, kills people, but in those cases where the government does it, it's not murder, right? And I think this type of bending of what a right is, is important, which is we need to view rights as ideals that then can be exploited when the, the, the right-making party considers it necessary. I see. So we don't consider, you know, the people who died in a war murdered. We consider them killed and we don't consider it illegal we consider it as necessary so then it, it's e even though it's the same event occurring just in a different context it, because it's in a different context we we don't regard it as the same right that's being violated yeah. I mean, you could even imagine this where like, if I was to hold a gun to your head and then say, rape your mom, right? Then you, then would you be arrested for raping your mom? So that's the thing. So rights, uh, they still have to bend to the, the, con the conception of necessary in the, when they go to, you know, trial or yeah be that trial oh. symbolic or, or oh, I, I see holding a gun to my head to make to force me to rape my mom i thought you were saying yeah. like okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I i understand so yeah under coercion that's going on the i think that actually happened there was a movie with uh jesse eisenberg where he was had a bomb strapped to his chest and then he had to rob a bank <laughs> <laughs> but right. I, yeah, right. it kind of. Well, it's also this, like that dark. It's a pretty funny yeah. movie, actually. Uh, that remember. dark mirror episode with the uh, with the the pedophilic teenager. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That that was yeah. a. So yeah, in, in those circumstances where you're blackmailed <laughs> to do a, a crime, there's. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know what the legal case is for that. I, I know that the person that blackmailed you it can be charged for that crime. But I'm not sure what happens to the person that actually followed through with it. It might be that they yep. ha are like, have some time off for it. Because that's kind of the thing, like even in those situations where like, uh, you're presented with a no-win option, you can either die or do this thing. You still have the, that option of, okay, I'm just gonna die because this is such a violation yeah. of my own, eth my own, uh, my own uh, what conscience yeah. that I'm not going but, to go through with. It would be better if I had died than to have to live with this violation of, in my conscience. Yeah. yeah. However, people aren't particularly principled. 
Yeah. <laughs> so you, you can't you can't defend the average taxpayer in principle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think that, that's kind of that's. I haven't looked into it enough, but I, I, I'm, I think I'm leaning somewhat more towards virtue ethics, where a person can, like, like e even if, okay, you, you can kind of, like, uh, praise a person for what they've done, even in, so you, in situations where they didn't need to. So, like, say, I, I have a position of power over you, and I could treat you like trash, but instead I'm going to treat you like a peer and, and lend you help or, or something like that. That That is something that is an action that would be morally praiseworthy. Uh, and then mm -hmm. kind of the opposite of morally blameworthy. So like it, nobody is really upset if I treat my enemies in, in, in such a way, like they're trying to kill me and so I kill them back for it. But uh, in a way like if they're trying to kill me and then I... I don't know, find a, a better alternative in which they they went out as well as I do. That is more praiseworthy than um, uh, the alternate outcomes. But it, that that might be so, sort of side topic because I think most veganists are either utilitarian or deontological ethicists, where like any any amount of harm that anything that you do that causes harm or exploitation of an animal through your actions is in, in an ethical violation, I guess, of either their rights or your responsibilities as a moral agent and that should right. not have been done. Now, I, I kind of wanted to go into the question of like whether or not animals can have a reciprocal relationship with their, I, I guess, butchers in a sense. So you can think about it in, in a natural setting of say the the zebras or, or actually let's go with deers since if, if deers um do not have some sort of predator taking them out they're going to overpopulate the area and kind of damage the natural climate to the point where it's actually for the benefit of the deers if they don't uh overpopulate and that's right almost sort of a sense where yeah. it's better like you could think of it as a mutual, mutualistic relationship between the wolves and the deers in which right. the, sure, the, the deers get to live a certain amount of life uh, and then the weakest one or the one that is a little bit foolish and steps too far outside of the, the comfort zone gets eaten right. by uh, the, the wolves out there. There's right. almost like a reciprocal relationship between the deers as a group and the wolves as a group that um, I, I guess could possibly be extended out, out onto human interaction with animals, like somewhat. Right. Uh, right. So yeah, go ahead. So with that, if we're granting animals agency, that is non human animal agency, that seems to be the consent of that argumentation. Then why do we not do that same central planning of control killing with humans? Right. We'll just be like, there's too many Africans. They're overpopulating. Let's just murder you know, a half a billion of them. Um, so that's one of the things is, is we would need to consider the arguments in under the vegan mindset as would they also apply to humans, um, that type of planning. So, but I, I gave you like an instance before with uh, the, the, so for instance, uh, necessary killing, I think this is things like pest control, right? So in Australia, there's pigs, uh, Australia has never had pigs before and now there's wild boars and they destroy their habitat. So the Australians deploy uh, the military and helicopters to snipe the pigs. And another one is the cane toads. The Australian deploys the military every wet season in the northern part of Australia to then kill the cane toads. And so these are instances, or even in a home, if we have cockroaches, mm -hmm we must now kill the cockroaches to avoid necessary harm to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So these are instances. So one is like, like there's a Mongolian starving to death, you must eat the horse. So there's a, a, a symbolic relationship. Sorry, not a, a what's the word? Um, mutualistic relationship between the horses um, and the humans. Uh, 
you know, if they were eat the best horse, things would suck if they ate all the horses. So it becomes an e ecological relationship, mm -hmm. a mutualistic ecological relationship between those. Uh, but it's also for the point of avoiding harm to the human. And with pest control, killing the cockroaches, killing the boars, killing the cane toads, uh, these are still uh, ways of avoiding harm to the human. Now, if we were going to say, well, we should, the, beer, the deers are better off because we're killing them, um, is going to be quite a morally contentious argument if you also use it on humans. Um, because the, so to spill the vegan perspective is we should try and promote freedom within all individuals because the concession that veganism kind of makes is that animals, uh, non-human animals, are people just like human animals are. Mm -hmm. And therefore, as people, they are individuals with their own desires, their own intentions, their own wills, their own fears. Uh, and we should respect that, but also forfeit it when it is interfering with our own progress. Um, and the progress area there is still about unnecessary and necessary cruelty, um, which is, you know, if we're going to kill, then this is also the well-being argument. Uh, then we should kill in the most painless, inconvenient way possible, which would be a bullet. So, like a, it's the thing that they use. It's a bolt gun, yeah, uh, and it goes directly into the brain, right? Compared to the halal slaughtering of the neck, which is just fucking insane. Um, it's yeah, uh, yeah, I've seen those videos. Yeah. So for, for those things, then that's good. Like we need, we want to reduce any cruelty and as much suffering as possible. But at the end, we want to say, well, the suffering should be unnecessary um, in the first place. Like it, it's, it, it just, so this is another thing that's, that's important to take into account, which is the timing of veganism, right? Veganism, the vegan society, I think was 1951. Uh, it set up in that, by the time period, yeah, 1951, uh, the vegan society was established, right? And this co coalesced quite well with, with nutritional adequacy from supermarkets, right? This is the first time in history that the average Westerner has now got the possibility of no longer consuming animals. Now the cognitive, like now they can overcome um, that necessity of cruelty. So no longer you know, must they say the prayer to that I must, you know, that, you know, thanks God for sacrificing this animal so I can live. Now we don't need to sacrifice the animal anymore. And so this is where some veganism uh, proponents I'm horrified by when they're promoting veganism as this inalienable necessity to everybody. Um, but their version of veganism doesn't take into account necessary violation, doesn't take into account necessary um, uh, uh, cruelty. So this would be a case of selling, you know, the Mongolians, Hey, you got to go vegan. Um, but what do they mean by vegan there? Because in my opinion, those Mongolians already are vegan. The, um, the, if, because they have no other option, it is necessary cruelty. They are vegan. They are avoiding exploiting animals. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it so, seems like within this so, the term of exploitation is like, like unnecessary taking of oh against their will. Yeah. So if it's necessary taking a, a, of their will, it doesn't like count as exploitation. It seems like. Yeah. Yeah. So so this is where starting off with the definition that they're using is incredibly important because yeah, most vegans are like you know where is it like you know they wear the shirts or the paraphilia like meat is murder and you know pad powered right like. Sorry, the Mongolian can't go plant powered. Uh, tough biggies, right? Like, what are you going to do when you when you go to the Balinese ceremony or the birthday party in the Philippines, and then be like, "Oh, this is immoral that you're eating chicken or pig." Like, no, fuck you. Like, you're causing harm there by raising this objection, and also it has it's not just harm in that instance of hurting the this. Uh, uh, sensitive, uh, what is it? Sentiments of the humans. It's also long-term harm in terms of if they were to adopt veganism, like, sorry, plant-based food, uh, then they do not have the capacity to do it nutritionally, uh, completely. 
and they will deteriorate. And this is horrendous. We should not be promoting, um, you know, this Western sensitivity towards those still in the developing world. Right. Yeah. And you kind of see that sometimes with like their, um, uh, yeah, like fossil fuel fuels usage and things like that. But, but yeah. It, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's like something the right wingers have up on the left wingers when it comes to climate change, right? Like the left wingers are like, you know, any carbon emission is immoral. And then, you know, they're trying to campaign where, you know, yeah, like that's actually pretty much what they believe. Like any carbon emission is immoral and never justified. And it's just like, what, what? And that's when the, uh, the right wingers then come up and then be like, well, those, uh, those emissions are as what, providing your safety and your comfort today and not just safety and comfort in the western world but necessary uh cruelty avoidance in the developing world Mm -hmm. um Uh, if you were to remove fossil fuels in the developing world they would quickly die quite quickly right i i'm curious and like if it seems like you're saying that for the mongolians it's better that they um have this animal-based diet because it still provides their necessary nutritional requirements. But it, I don't know, it it might be the case that like some vegans would say that it's better to live a, in a kind of nutrient deficient uh, position because you can, you're able to withstand that rather than killing an animal that like between the trade off of, oh, being nutrient deficient. uh, Right living in th- yeah. that type of life yeah it's better to take that trade right yeah so so this this is where we could invoke jainism in india right so jainism is one of the oldest religions uh and the, they take veganism to the extreme which is that their veganism doesn't take into account trade-offs uh it is purely where where harm is is where any uh, violation of the animal's will is immoral. And so that's the thing, like if, if vegans believe that, then they need to practice Jainism if they're wanting to go in that camp of veganism, um, which is, well, well, rather it's not veganism then that they're advocating for, it's Jainism. So with Jainism, uh, any animal, even plants, uh, all living things uh, are considered you know, a life, a person, something that has will, something that has energy, something, even perhaps the earth, they would, cons- like that's Gaia theory, that the earth has a will. Mm-hmm. And so for them, any violation of another being's will is immoral. So the priests will not wear clothes, they will wear face masks to avoid harming the bacteria. Um, they will not eat potato, they will not eat beetroot because eating potato or beetroot kills the entire plant. Um, they will only eat uh, food that has fallen uh, or fruit. They will pretty much only eat uh, fruit and things that do not kill the plant. So uh, that is, this also is somewhat to the extent of why Steve Jobs went fruititarian uh, for ethical reasons. Um, because fruit doesn't cause any harm, uh, the consumption of fruit, except for them. Um, so that's fine. Like if people want to opt into that, that's fine. But uh, this is one of the issues with utilitarianism. It's it's, it's inherently self-righteous communism, uh, which is, or self-righteous central planning, which is my reasoning outweighs your reasoning. Therefore, I get to oppress you. Or because I and some others believe our reasoning is superior, we now get to oppress your your freedom. And this to me is uh, seems to be quite immoral. Instead, it's up to the in- individual to then decide how they wish to uh, live um, and have that consent on the individual. So if some, some people want to become Jains and then sacrifice nutrition, then good on them. But the, for... For I think the average Westerner, veganism is an easier adoption um, because the uh, it's easier to be nutrient complete on Western veganism than it is to be be nutritionally complete on Jainism. Um, however, then again, uh, 
you also have the 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 decision costs and all the rest. Like I, there's no reason why I couldn't eat a Jain diet over here besides I like potatoes, but true. <laughs> and you know, I like beetroot and I like those benefits of those particular foods. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that extent, uh, you know, I am doing unnecessary cruelty to plant life by eating those foods. But at the same time, I'm still doing a trade off where I want to have more benefit through my work and hope my benefit, you know, in my work will outplace the the detriments that I contribute to society. Mm-hmm. Whereas Jainism is more about removing any detriment. It is like a, a what is it, zero tolerance. Right. Uh, why yeah, and, yeah, and that's like one of the, I, I guess, rules of justification that you can sometimes use, I, I, I guess, is like for the Mongolians, for wait no uh yeah if, if it would be better for the mongolians to um i i guess emerge out of their position of requirement to to eat an animal-based diet to eventually uh i guess progress into a western kind of position of being able to eat a, an only plant-based yeah. diet but and it would be ethically yeah. better for them to move transition into that position which would only happen through yeah. the act of immorality or, or the yeah but uh, unless the, yeah unless unless they're going to live in a jainist permaculture then the average you know your supermarket is still killing thousands of insects right like pests you know we deploy pesticides uh to kill thousands of insects and then at harvesting time we're probably going to be killing mice um and whatever else uh that plagues crops right so if if we're then going to be shipping the mongolians supermarket food that is still going to be causing more ecological harm as well as more ethical harm than their existence and this is like this is a thing that really threatened my my naive conception of veganism back in the day and then you know ended up you know causing all this research because I was just like, wait, maybe I need to become a Mongolian. <laughs> like, if I actually really believe what what I what I what I'm saying, and yeah, then, you um, mentioned the thing about and then yeah, I was the able wheat. to come up with this consistent thing. Yeah, you're yeah. mentioning the thing about the wheat. Like every acre, you're killing what nine hundred something rats. Yeah, through doing it. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Australian. Um, uh the asio the australian intelligence agency so they released the study however the there i read the study and unfortunately they didn't do it by yield they did it by kilom uh by kilometer or something like that so unfortunately the way that they presented the data this allows for correct equivalent comparison however if you purely do it by kilometer by area then kangaroo meat kills less animals than wheat does um, because wheat, you have the mice issue. Mm. So per, I think it was like per calorie and per uh, gram of protein, kangaroo meat is more efficient. Um, however, because it's by kilometer rather than by yield, this is very, um, the, the study needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, but kangaroo meat, out of all the meats from animals, is incredibly efficient because it is a wild animal that is then hunted and killed, and it's a lot of muscle. Um, so if people are wanting to get you know, an incredibly efficient source of uh, protein and ecological and ethical source of protein, kangaroo meat is actually quite up there. Um, so, so this is also one of the issues of also why kangaroo meat is, would be superior compared to like a dairy or you know factory farming or, or this is where you get into the well-being side like grass-fed beef and those things mm-hmm. which is like it's better for an animal to be free and then killed than to be enslaved and then killed mm-hmm. um however it's hard to then say that if the animal's killing date is predetermined then it was it ever free and this is um where you get more into the yeah you know, the I, 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 I want to dig but, into that because that that's the one thing that like I certainly agree with you that the conditions of factory farming is atrocious and something that like should be kind of like burned to the ground. Uh, well, not with the animals within it, but it, and, and I, 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 or even I, with the animals really. 
maybe i don't know <laughs> but <laughs> but i i i think i see that almost more as a side effect to modernity and the our capitalistic structure maybe uh that it what and Sorry. i'd like to see One. alternative uh, uh, you go ahead yeah. uh, and then i'll finish my thought yeah uh Sorry. Yeah. The, what well, the issue with factory farming is it's necessary to supply the demand. And mm -hmm. like, that's the thing. There is not enough land on the world to do organic, uh, you know, the free roaming, uh, uh, animal production to meet the demand for animals. Uh, that is why factory farming exists. It, there, so it, if people are going to promote grass fed beef, there's still not enough land. Uh, in the world, if everyone moves their protein to grass-fed beef, this is one of the um, the big issues with it. Mm. So, so the only like if you burn the factory farm, it doesn't matter because the demand still exists. You need to kill the demand. Yeah, 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 and, and I agree with that. Like trying to find better alternatives to that. The one thing I wanted to ask you about though is like for the. Uh, I guess, happier farms, if you want to call it that, that are more localized and uh, not like where the, the animals can have a relationship with their family. And I think they're protected also from, instead of having to live out in the wild against the risk of predators, they're within a constrained area and they're, the farmers are there to protect them. Like you, you had mentioned that it, it was, it would be better for the animals to be free, but I, I, I'm kind of thinking about that. Like if, if the animals are getting, gaining some sort of benefit by having a mutualistic relationship with the butcher, uh, of course, they're inevitably going to be killed at, at some point uh, a after having lived a certain period of time. I mean, they're going to die anyway. Uh, so I, I, I'm thinking like, is it, really better for an animal to live in captivity safe from i guess stress and, and dangers right. and malnourishment living out in the wild uh, uh, uh are which, which of those two options is would you consider at least better right yeah so that's that's a great question so uh, it invokes a few things so one is uh because it evokes a few things, it's going to be challenging sure. to, to answer because I, I need my mental capacity yeah. um, uh, to remember all the different ones. So the thing is, is, so one is you're now going back, like that situation is now going back like 200 years to before, you know, veganism was, was an option. Um, so we're now, you know, going back to the agricultural way of 200 years ago. Um, however, the thing is, is that at... And it's also now resembling and even invoking that type of mutualistic relationship that the Mongolians have, have right? Which is there's a, you know, a relationship and, and it's also even invoking the relationship that a lion has over the zebra, right? It, there, there is a difference the though. Capacity. There is the difference though, because I do agree that the, the person themselves have, like the people, they have a, I guess, a hierarchical superiority where they're the ones imposing their will upon the animals in that situation for the animal uh, yeah. for like say the lion in the wild they're in a situation where they have no control to do one or the other whereas for the farmer they're somebody that are doing this by choice and intentionality when without the necessity there yeah well, I, well for a farmer they're not going to be killing the animals without uh, so, so again, it, it depends. Is this farmer killing animals for other people? Are we talking about the farmer just providing the animals for themselves? If we focus on the more challenging one, which is the farmer just providing the animals for their own self, the the uh, you know the self-sufficient farmer, right? The uh, the Walden type farmer, if, if you will, right? Then this is one that resembles more the relationship with the the. No Mongolian nomads or the Papua New Guinean hunter gatherers. Now, in this situation as well, they're not going to be killing the the cows needlessly. They're going to be killing those only when it's necessary to do so. They they're not going to be gluttonous because gluttonous will destroy the the ecology. Now, the the challenge here is this is a regression back to 200 years ago before, and it avoids the progression that we have now, which is that. 
um, they could just grow soybeans. They could grow other things. They could import those few supplements that they actually re that vegans require. Um, so, but then again, I'm not going to go to them and then be like, hey, you know, this is immoral. As the same way, I wouldn't go to a um, a Mongolian nomad and say it's immoral because, you know, for that human, I need to consider the harm to the human. I mean, is living a Western city life where you have access to supermarkets and supplements enticing and invigorating for that human? Um, you know, maybe farm life uh, is the thing that actually causes them uh, less harm. So. Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, like addition to that because like within some of the more like higher density Western societies like Japan or South Korea, uh, there yeah. is such a high degree of suicide and, and kind of a loss of meaning. Yeah. And that like that uh, documentary you had sent me of the Hikikiori, I think, is something right. I, I've watched a couple times now and it's just really remarkable. And I see it as like a warning call from the future for the American West. <laughs> and I'm like trying to think of like, <laughs> how can this actually be avoided? Because that, that, that would just be awful <laughs> no. to, to be yeah. our progression that we're going towards. Yeah. Um, but, oh, but, okay. but this, go ahead. Sorry. This, so this is also where, you know, me as a individualist uh, differs from the utilitarian, right? Because the utilitarian will then be quick to invoke there's not enough land in the world for 6 billion people to run their own farms in that way. That is why we have factory farming. That is why we have monocultures of plant-based agriculture. So the utilitarian will run it out because that is not sustainable for all. And that's what the utilitarian cares about. But the individualist will say, well, it's up to the individual and then they'll figure it out as they go. <laughs> so. All right. So I wanted to, like going a little bit further into that thought experiment of like the, the farmer that is currently raising cattle and like, let's say they aren't only doing it for their own self-sufficiency, but the, the furthest extent that they have is maybe for their, their town. Say they have a town of, I don't know, a thousand yeah. or 5,000 or something like that. So they are creating a surplus of cattle that, so that it can be killed and eaten by the town in a way that's not necessary. And like, even now say, let's say some, ethical yeah. uh people come into or even like the 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 cultural attitude of the town changes more towards a plant-based diet so that uh soybeans it is kind of now in the market it to a greater extent than uh cattle meat and so this farmer will go through and breed out his cattle or no longer do the the enforced breeding with them uh maybe kill off the, the last of them just as he, as he would and kind of transform his farm into a soybean farm instead. Now, moving forward, there is a discontinuity for the cattle that like they have no opportunities to live out a, a life with meaningful re relationships with their own, like between each other yeah. uh, and, and living out a life. So it, it, it seems as though like, running the, I guess, trade off there. The vegan is saying that, yes, it is better that the cows in this other state do not exist because they don't go through that uh, suffering and, and uh, imposition of will at death at towards the end of their life. And it's better that they just don't have a life at, at all. Like you can conceive of a world, a yeah. world in which like cattle has either almost become a uh, unnecessary species and has just kind of died out because it no longer serves a ecological ecological niche aside from maybe wild cattle like bison or something like that but no longer domesticated yeah. cattle at least yeah well this is another instance like the the farmer would be better off with kangaroos um maybe than the actual cattle so why do you yeah. say that I uh, just, so kangaroos, so maybe, uh, I, at least the issue, but then again, I may be confusing American agriculture very differently from Australian agriculture because uh, the, th the land in Australia is quite different. I think kangaroos serve a basic ecological, ecological niche similar to uh, deer. And so like they right. eat a lot of the same things as deer, 
just um yeah so so that's the thing yeah so with um kangaroos they pretty much eat anything uh similar to a goat so mm. or they can operate without converting the land whereas cattle requires the land to be converted um gotcha. and that has a more ecological cost and also with cattle they're probably going to also be raising dairy cows and then you have the whole issue of dairy which is that you have to keep the cows constantly pregnant and then taking away the children um, to provide that dairy supply. And, th and that's where the more nuance of how the animal agriculture is done starts being invoked. Mm. Yeah. I see. So there's the element of suffering that's imposed upon dairy cattle, uh, dairy cattle by removing the, the, uh, the calf while it's still within its weaning phase and, and keeping the, the mother at, yep. at a kind of I mean, it, state of pregnancy. Yeah. Like, can we imagine doing that to a human mother? Like it's fucking insane. Mm -hmm. Like to consider what the cows go through, like the mother's scream for days. It's yeah. uh, it's insane. Yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah so, but, but, the larger issue here is, it, yeah, if, if the farmer is providing uh, uh, res like animal-based resources for those outside, then it's going to be a supply-demand relationship. More demand will occur. He will need to grow his business. And then it's preferential. Like those people could import, you know, alternative plant-based sources rather than engaging in that. And, you know, let's say he now has a million people demanding. Well, now he has to start, you know, doing more questionable practices to lead to the demand. And then you end up with factory farming. It's the same progression yeah. of why we now have factory farming. Yeah. That's why I, I, I'd like to, uh, I'm not so sure how capable uh, where our state of America will be at painting this, but of moving more towards a localized kind of like city like self-sufficient within a city type or, or a town um, size rather than kind of the, this well, global transportation. The, no, not if the leftists get their, uh, their open immigration happening because then you're <laughs> going to have the uh, limited population to do that. Yeah. Which is the uh, ironic thing. Like the leftists are like pro, pro environment <laughs> and like bad carbon emissions and yet they mm. want to import everybody. Yeah. It's interesting. All right. Concept has been raising some questions. I, I, I might bring, yeah, bring okay. them up with you. And some of them I, I've kind of go, yep. gone into similar topics. Let me see. Are vegans against having pets? You probably have a better understanding. Than right. That. Yeah. So, it, it, so yeah, this is a good, good question. And, and I was hoping to go more into this. So if we take the cat example, right, which mm -hmm. is the domestic cat is not intended for, so unlike dogs, dogs we domesticated uh, 20,000 years ago from the wolf or maybe 4,000 years ago. It, it's, it's significantly longer than the cat. Um, so dogs also, you know, were domesticated in Mongolia. We domesticated the horse first and then we moved on to domesticating the wolf into the dog. And dogs uh, have, through that domestication, um, have become a lot more harmonious with the human way of life. Uh, they're scavengers, they're, they're omnivorous, they can live entirely on plant-based food, um, they're fine. Uh, whereas cats, because of their very reduced domestication and, and also uh, their, their purely carnivorous history, unlike wolves, uh, then they require um, uh, meat. So, so it's unfortunate because so some instances uh, just invoke some other area of veganism to explain this. So roadkill is fine with vegans, hopefully, or we, you know, with the veganism that I'm presenting because there's no exploitation of an animal there. Lab-grown meat is another instance of this. Lab-grown dairy. Uh, all these instances are fine. So the thing is, this like, I maybe you know, so. It, it depends for the individual vegan on which time span they're looking at this necessary cruelty. Uh, because perhaps for the cat, they can invoke the argument that feeding, killing a hundred fish for a cat and in, 
imprisoning the cat into being an indoor cat when it's meant to be in a more wild environment. Well, so that's, that's the other. I'm not going to go for the wild <laughs> imprisonment uh, argument. But for the, the meat one, it is specifically they could say this is necessary cruelty until we have a lab-based meat alternative. They could invoke that argument. Um, and, you know, the, the vegan would be powerless to, uh, to, to prevent that. Um, however, it just seems fucking like it's insane, like to me to then say, like, we're going to sacrifice a hundred lives to protect one just because it's cute. It is insane to me. Um, uh, however, you know, that, that is the advantage of the, the cat genetics and its exploitation and it's Darwinian <laughs> exploitation, right? Well, it, um, I, it might for, not even just be exploitation because there's a benefit that's being provided as a pet, like a as I see yeah. more, like, but, but that, that, but that benefit, kids, it it, like, it, it, yeah, it seems like everybody that doesn't have kids always has to have a pet, and like maybe, yeah. given the fact that they weren't able to have kids, having a pet is like a close alternative that it yeah. provides a close, yeah, but, of, of it. yeah. But even so, that benefit is still Darwinian exploitation. Sure, right. but it's a mutual exploitation then. <laughs> like, yeah, it's a mutual, I'm exploiting yeah. the cat to provide a, a fake child for myself, and, and you're exploiting me to uh, feed you kibble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although, although considering it's swapping out the ability for the human to reproduce, the cat is definitely winning in this situation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's essentially parasitizing the, uh, the human... Uh, the human reproduction cycle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Concept Hut made, made a good point. Like, uh, cats do kill a lot of animals that they don't actually go through with eating. And it's yeah. like, yeah. The, and if there's any pets, other like animal are, as, yeah. as sadistic as humans, it'd probably be cats. <laughs> and I'm saying that as like a fan of cats, yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, cats, cats are a pest. Like, that's why they have to be an indoor cat. Because otherwise they are a pest, and um, because they kill the wildlife, kill the birds, kill you know the the indigenous population of an area, and um, yeah, the, the, and but then to keep them uh, as indoor cats is insane mm -hmm. uh, because they are not domesticated enough to like some cats, you know, some cat yeah. personalities are probably yeah, fine to be so. domesticated in that way. But, but that's like, the other thing too, like um, the the animals that cats usually are like predators who can be pest like animals. So like rats and mice yeah. and um, I, pigeons, like pigeons are kind pigeons. of like overrun throughout New York city. And so <laughs> yeah. there, there's a way in which like, despite being like killing their surplus. Although oh, oh, then, then again, New York city these. is not a, uh, a, a, <laughs> yeah, a, that's true. it doesn't yeah, resemble wanna... a natural ecology at all. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I, yeah, and I don't want to resemble yeah. the world to be more like New York City, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, 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 it's still I, kind of that like, definition of a case like, is just annoying. <laughs> yeah, but similar <laughs> to like, okay, uh, where there are the, the pigs that are overrun, and that's the thing, like wild pigs right. are... Like we, we get that in, in like places like New Mexico and Arizona where there's just herds and herds of like wild boars that uh, go around that you kind of have to kill off in mass without being able to like yep. use them all for meat. Like, I mean, sure, they're providing some sort of uh, sustenance, say, to like ants or condors, uh, vultures, things like that, or possums. But it, it's still not like direct application from... Uh, killing them just so that they can go through. And so like, it, I mean, at, at least it is the case that most, I don't know, uh, most animals that die provide some sort of benefit to some of the other animals that are out there, be it microbes or ants or things on, or humans or, or, or other animals like possums on, on some sort of scale that there's like no real waste going on. I actually think like there is quite a bit more waste going on within humans and like, uh, that's definitely the accurate critique of uh, carnism within our modernist society is that we're providing, we're, pro yeah, we're, we're taking up way too much food that isn't actually, it's just being spoiled and it's not like providing any sustenance for 
either humans or other animals or like being given to the poor or anything like that, which is something that I would like to do what I, whatever I can to keep from happening. But I don't know yeah. where that'll go exactly. Yeah. So pets, there, there's the other aspect of pets. So the imprisonment one, as well as the, uh, because it's essentially like there is a restriction of the freedom of the pet. That is why they're a pet rather than a family member or an individual. And, you know, when the dog go outside, it's on a leash, you know, they're kept inside, there's a fence. And, uh, and also they're selectively bred. They're also de-sexed. Um, so there is like, you know, sentiments of slavery, the sentiments of, uh, you know, imprisonment, those things, it's sentiments of reduction of freedom. And that's where it's like a lot harder to then invoke, um, <coughs> Sorry. you know, more com compassionate necessity uh, to, especially like when you go overseas. So for instance, in Bali, the stray cats are in a very dire situation. Um, because there is a lot less meat for them to eat than there is, you know, for dogs to scavenge. However, the dogs, so, so the Balinese consider dogs and cats, well, for cats, they're purely food. They have no purpose besides food. Whereas the, um, the, the dogs are security plus um, food. Uh, that's the purpose that they serve to the humans. However, they have no fences. The dogs are actually completely free. And um, it's actually surprising how happy the dogs are until they are afflicted by disease. Um, they hang out with all of the buddies the whole day. They do the whole routine. Then they go back to the home at night. And it is, uh, it's actually, you know, it's really interesting just kind of how happy they are in freedom until disease gets them. Um, similar to a human, um, whereas a domesticated dog, like as cute as they can be, you know, especially the really useless ones, um, such as like Chihuahuas and, and Maltese Lapsos and those things. Um, those ones, it, it's hard to then say because, you know, you can de-sex them and you know, have a very great relationship and the dog loves you and it's really genuine and true. But then there's also the cost of that, which is the owners that don't desex the dogs. There's also the desection, like there's a cost of a reduction of freedom. And there is a, like sometimes you like with some dogs, like my mom's had several dogs and uh, the, she had a Maltese lap, so called Jack. But sometimes you would look in Jack's mind as he stares out to the park across the road behind the fence. And you kind of get the sentiment he knows he's imprisoned. And especially when you see the anxiety that like separation anxiety that dogs have, they're pack animals. And, um, and you know, it's, it's kind of like an egotistical, like longing for that attention and that love to be solely focused on me, like, sorry, narcissistic uh, that the humans deploy. Now for my mom, this time she got two dogs, um, two brothers from the same litter and they will play with each other and they'll never come to the human for playing but they're incredibly happy they never particularly consider themselves to be imprisoned and uh because they have each other and this is similar to the the balinese dogs where they hang around with their friends the entire day until disease uh, captures them so it's quite hard this the sacrificing of freedoms to to consider that um, that, and yeah, the, the things like, I, I really think for a dog that no one should have a, a single dog, um, because otherwise the dog can confuse itself too much to be a human and, and suffer, um, mm. uh, conceptually. Well, sorry, like, uh, psychologically, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So, okay. Maybe I can kind of steer more into my opening argument that I think no, actually concept had kind of missed out on that. It seems as though using this principle, like it, understanding that it's not like a, it, it, it's not something, 
okay, using this principle of like, we, it, we should not exploit animals or we should not uh, impose harm or suffering upon animals, then it seems as though the correct course of action is to reshape society and our environment such that animals cease to exist because it, it might be, it seems as though at least that the nature of existence requires some element of an imposition of will upon whatever you are as a creature. Like you're going to die. And if your will is that you don't die, uh, that's an imposition of will or you're, you're going to experience some, some amount of pain. And if it's, the will that you don't go through that pain, then that's uh, also a, a, a violation of that uh, desire that you have. And so, I, I, I don't know, just thinking about like using that principle of veganism at, as a ethical tool in how we're restructuring society, it, it would uh, like the best possible world would be one in which Animals get to live out their happy life, b doing what pleases them. But they well, are... it's not necessarily happy. The the the, the thing is free. They get to right, live right. Their, yeah, their free sure. life. Yeah, yeah, free life, able to do what what they will. However, they are sterilized so that they don't get to progen progenerate. That, I don't know if that's the correct terminology. Uh, same for for people and. and so that, like, for all life, it, it kind of ceases, at least conscious life. Any life in which Wait. suffering can occur would be, uh, this would be kind of the best possible world under the... Ah, uh, th this paradigm. is the invocation of antinatalism. Correct. Um, well, well, yeah, so this is where veganism, yeah, veganism isn't, you know, about maximizing happiness of animals. It's about increasing the freedom of animals. Uh, so that's where antinatalism... Like that's my own criticism of antinatalism is this about reducing suffering rather than increasing freedom. And what we care about is freedom. That's why we want to have dozens of babies, uh, dozens of children and allow them to be, you know, express freedom and participate in the game of freedom. Um, and that's, yeah. All right. So, <laughs> so then yeah, a world I, in which I, an animal does not exist is worse than a world in which that animal does exist because why, why, while it, it does it, exist, it's able to enact its freedom or it, it's it enact yeah. its freedom of the will. Yeah, but it, it's more like, um, well, I wouldn't really go so far as, as prescribing that because one of the aspects of we should be hands off in the similar way we have nature, natural reserves, which were kind of hands off to an extent mm -hmm. besides the preservation of them. Um, so, and, and again, we're not going to be like desexing possums and raccoons, right? What we're going to be doing is, uh, is gradually phasing out the selective reproduction of animal agricultural animals, domesticated animals, mm -hmm. and we're going to be increasing the selective reproduction of plant-based uh, sources of nutrition. And you know, with the understanding that plant, for, plants don't suffer, at least to not the same extent that uh, animals well, suffer. Well even if, if, well, even if they do suffer to the same extent, there's still going to be less overall suffering because right. to grow an animal, the animal must also consume plants. Oh, and okay. so by it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with, with the idea that, yeah, we want to breed out the animals that, or breed out the animals that cause more suffering and breed up the animals that do not cause that same suffering, which seems as though like, like conscious entities. So maybe, well, yeah, well, just, well, just, well, we're not, we're not deliberately going out and then saying, you know, let's, yeah, I, I, it's not specifically like breeding out as a, as a deterministic policy. It's just gradual as just demand. Within, demand just within demands. what's under our control of like what's our, we're yeah. like currently selectively breeding cattle to be uh, repopulated and, and then killed off. Yeah. So just and in the same way, like we do, we don't also want to be desexing, you know, the Africans, right? 
we 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 just want to also have it hands off so they eventually discover their own their own ability. I, I see. Well, so, it also depends. Yeah, well, it's not. We're not particularly entirely hands off uh, because we have an invested interest in other humans, right? But we don't really have particularly invested interests in other animal populations, like certain insect species. We don't have any invested interests, so we're going to be completely hands off with <laughs> with <laughs> species we don't have an invested interest in preserving. Because uh, at the end of the day, the humans are still, we have an invested interest in our own propagation. And so we're going to care about species that facilitate our, um, our interest in ourselves. Uh, so, you know, that's why we grow apples rather than non-fruit bearing uh, trees, things like that. Um, but however, we also need to take care of the environment and that's where we have natural reserves. And also it's nice to actually see nature uh, before man-made influence on it. Right. Um, I guess, but yeah. I mean that that's kind of the thing. Like just being hands off. Sorry, it doesn't... Wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Uh, so this is this is important. Vegans are against zoos for the same reason. We're for natural reserves, oh, yeah. for conservatories, but we're against zoos uh, because one enslaves and imprisons the other one, uh, maintains the freedom of the animal. Right. Yeah, and, and also and the sense. nurturing of the animal to promote the freedom. But oh, okay, so we're oh yes, hands off. Um, that that's the thing though. Like e even being hands off with nature, that doesn't like stop the carnivores that are within nature, like the the wolves and the the lions, from still continuing on with the yeah. unethical imposition of will upon the other animals. So it, it, yeah. if if what? it being within our control, like what is within our control is our responsibility to keep from occurring. And we don't want the exploitation or the harm of animals to occur. Then we have almost an ethical obligation then following our, those principles to put some sort of restriction on the, the lives, even in nature. Right. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's, I guess, you know, an argument for the utilitarian um, central planning style uh, vegans. However, I, I think the, the argument is then against freedom. Uh, because the thing is, as well, it's again, like a vegan shouldn't have an issue with unavoidable necessary harm. Uh, but then they would say, well, it's avoidable harm, we could kill the lions. Um, however, then you're impacting the ecology. It's the same thing of how Yellowstone, they killed all the wolves and then the ecology went to shit. So then they reintroduced the wolves and it got better. Um, like at the end, we're, we're wanting, and, and it's, you know, the same thing. Like we don't want to do such selective um, violation. Like, because then you're killing the animals. You're actually invoking, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it just seems odd to me to then cause suffering, to then reduce suffering um, in a long-term game. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to be consistent. What? Because you would have to kill the lions. Yeah. This is, I don't know, kind of a, a question that, I don't know, maybe it sounds stupid, but... What, uh, plus it's also like, what place, what place does a, a, a species have with interfering with the ecology that we're not a part of like right. like to some extent i think this is why veganism also goes into like the hippie communities that also the green parties and the indigenous parties right because to some extent that sentiment would then relate to well we shouldn't uh colonize uh the indigenous human populations mm -hmm. um of areas we shouldn't be imposing our way of life onto them and it's the same thing with stargate and i guess star trek i'm not i never watched star trek so i don't know but in stargate there was the the rule that we will not interfere and we will not maintain relations with alien species that are not um as advanced as we are um right. yeah, because I think that's otherwise trek, that's the prime directive within Star Trek. Right. Um, yeah. And but, so, but, yeah, I was gonna, just going to say but, that. Yeah. <laughs> you can finish it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. But so this, so, so I think, so that's an interesting observation now for that about the crossover of vegans in different circles, why you find vegan in the indigenous right community. Um, it's similar sentiments uh, there. 
So, you know, one could then say, well, we should colonize the savages to remove their barbarism and their evil morality. Um, but on the other extent, was that better than just letting them come to the conclusion themselves? Um, because the long-term harm wasn't actually what we considered it to be. The indigenous people are having an incredibly hard time adapting. Um, so, and it's the same thing with killing the wolves in Yellowstone. And then the long-term consequence of that was not what we anticipated and killing the elephants in Africa was not what we anticipated. All right. Um, where was it? Oh, yes. I was going to go into... Written it down. Hands off. Oh yeah, the hands off approach. For okay, so we we can say that like okay, we don't like we're only going to focus on. Sorry. We only we want to like step away from all the things that are under our own control and, and just let nature kind of run its own course for these other things. But that's the thing, like, even within Until nature, it's necessary to interfere. Gotcha. Because, well, yeah, cause, because within nature, there's all, all, already going to be this, I guess, imposition of will upon nature. Say, like, the lion is imposing upon the ecology of the gazelles in order to kill one of them. And the gazelles are imposing upon the ecology of the, the grasslands in, in order to, like, selectively breed some... Mm some things and not others. Mm. Right. So I think this is actually a big, what we just touched on here is a big realization of the difference between the utilitarian and the individualist, which is the utilitarian will, you know, impose, you know, I say killing all the lions, right? Because they want to avoid unnecessary cruelty. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is it necessary to kill all the lions? Right, and this is where the the uh, libertarian, uh, which is versed in economics, differs from the politician who is versed in exploiting economics, um, kind of thing. Which is the like a lot of uh, policy that a politician will go for. It's it's not actually necessary in the long term, um, uh, and it's also for special interests in the rest. So, I, but. I think this is a big, big aspect, which is for the utilitarian, they're not considering whether their policies are actually necessary. Um, right. So it's the same thing for the natural reserve. Like the national reserve is great until it's necessary for us to level it and then build something else there. Right. <laughs> so maybe we, we can get into that idea more so, because it seems like a lot of it rests upon the idea of necessity. But Necessity can kind of mean multiple things in, in, in a lot of ways where the you can say that in order for X, it is necessary we do Y. Uh, or you could think right. about it as in like, okay, based upon the, the, the nature of, say, this living creature, it is necessary to do these certain things in order to sustain its own existence. And so like you can think about necessity in regards to the requirements of a creature or necessity in regards to your, like, the the I ideal world that you're trying to create. So, like, if, if the ideal you're trying to create is one in which, what's a, like, mosquitoes no longer exist because they cause so much harm right. to developing nations, then you're yeah. not, you're kind of sacrificing the necessity of the sustaining continued existence of the mosquito for the, 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 the ideal world that you have in mind, one in which mosquitoes are no longer carrying ma malaria to uh, uh, people and, and killing off plenty of animals there. So, so right. what, what is the probably usage, do you think that uh, vegans are normally using and maybe what, what you're using? Because maybe they differ in some way. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing with government policy. So like in that book that I recommended, The Economics in One Lesson by Henry Latzig, right? In it, he talks about with uh, this kind of uh, two branches of eco uh, economics. One is that which uh, focuses on economic policy to benefit a specific group in a specific time frame, regardless of long-term consequences or side effects. 
And then there's the other one, which will focus purely on uh, policies that benefit everyone in, in long-term uh, effects. So one which so one is sustainable policies and the other one is immediate policies. Mm -hmm. um, and politicians go on immediate policies because it gives them more sway and perpetuates the pol political machine. Right. Which is that's uh, mm -hmm. you have different parties all voting to expand their power, and then you know if everyone's trying to control the the power to paras parasitize the power, then um, you know it's beneficial to to everyone trying to participate in that power game. That's a really um, interesting well, um, yeah. observation. It's just like I, I automatically kind of connected it to the differences between having a monarchy with a system of like your your lineage will remain in control versus a presidency where your power is restrained by I don't know your your own singular generation. That's a uh, that's interesting to think because like it within the monarchy scenario, you're incentivized based of, upon your own genes to create long-standing uh, sustained, a long-standing sustained uh, country or society. Whereas at, you're within the presidency, maybe you're more incentivized to work on short-term gains that are detrimental to long-term uh, system. Well, it's also your legacy, right? Your legacy in a monarchy is to build a powerful kingdom. Whereas the legacy in a presidency is to get elected. Right. And then there's a limitation to how many times you can do that. No. But I mean, like, they, they don't particularly care about the, um, the outcomes. They just care about it getting elected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the power of that. Right? It, it doesn't really, like, the incentive for them. Like, you know, if, like... If we imprisoned them, if they didn't live up to the policies, maybe then we would have a, a incentive scheme where they actually yeah. cared about the people rather than getting elected. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny because like, I'm actually in favor of, I, I guess, tyranny or tyranny of the masses where if a king or a presidency is not fulfilling its requirements for the, its people, they have almost like a right then <laughs> to... Uh, to keep to keep him in fear and and to kill him if he's not doing right. so. I think there's kind of a right. mutual element there where like okay, the king is in power and they have control over the people, but if the king is failing to keep the people happy, they have they can overturn that power by working against them. Yeah. However, the that that type of revolution is prone to more revolution. Because right. it's not a sustainable strategy of, of governance. Right. Because, yeah, that's the thing. Like, in yeah. order to gain power, you do so by killing the person that's in power. Yeah. So that, that just kind of... That's, that's also why... For yourself. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's also where America was a retaliation to the French. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons the Constitution differs in right. those areas. Yeah. But the the... I've actually, as a, as a side point, I want to maybe do a beverage session on this. Uh, I've been reading some more uh, intense things on more controversial philosophy and, uh, and whatnot, and especially by Cody Wilson, the guy who did um, defense distributed the 3D printed guns. Oh, yeah. So he actually studied law, hmm. and he studied... Uh, so he read libertarianism on his side. Uh, mm -hmm. So he was early induced into philosophy. So he read libertarianism on the side, but to get law, he studied Marxism and postmodernism, which are the tools of revolution. So he's paired libertarianism with the tools of revolution. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting observations he's had, which another book that I recently just read by Jacob uh, Apple called The Man Who Wouldn't Stand Up, um, there's the concept that... So each of us have ourself as a person, and then we also have a persona. Mm -hmm. And if we acknowledge that these things differ, then it has interesting effects on hypocrisy and also on social relations and social obligations. So a celebrity, all celebrities who are in the business of cultivating uh, their personas unique to the social good. 
where just just put on silent. <laughs> right? Well, I where, have these so... reminders for myself. I, I didn't know how long this was going to last. Uh, I wanna, uh, okay. I want to make sure yeah, right. I get to it at some point. So uh, I just keep on like putting it off oh, for yeah. an hour. Ah, uh, 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 okay. All right. Yeah. So the uh, yeah. So we have personas, right? But but so one of the interesting things about democracy is uh, it when we consider the role of personas are playing in here. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the desire to be liked. So, for, so the man who wouldn't stand up is what he's the man who wouldn't stand up at a baseball game to God bless America. And then mm -hmm. they tried to use the tool of shame of the big screen that focused on him to then mm -hmm. get him to submit to the to the persona that the public good expected of him. Um, however, he stuck his tongue out, and that caused riots and protests and essentially the destruction of him of himself because he refused to apologize. Was this the guy, um, whereas the 3D other printer for guns guy or some other guy? No, no, this is the, the book, uh, The Man Who Wouldn't Stand Up by Jake. Oh, uh, is it a uh, fictional Apple. story? Right. Oh, yeah, it's okay. a fictional story, yeah. Okay, gotcha. And uh, yeah, so in this, uh, so his life ends up going through like some dips and turns. It's, it's really, like I, I can expand on it in 10 minutes, but I'm not going to, but but when we tie that into the other side, which is essentially that ties into the hypocrisy thing from there. But when it comes to democracy, uh, Cody Wilson ended up uh, uh, recognizing and then and explaining is that de democracy isn't about um, uh, uh, reflecting the desires of the nation. It's actually about submitting the individual to the desires of the nation, which is to submit the individual persona to the to what is considered to be the public good. So when you're voting, what you're actually voting for is when you cast your vote, you're actually casting your allegiance to what you perceive uh, that the public persona should be. Your public and, persona or like the collective public persona? Yeah, the, co the collective uh, public I persona. See. Um, mm. So it, I it's, see. it's uh, actually... So like, you're, so like if your idea of what the world wants is based upon like what you're getting from your news feed, your Twitter feed, and these are all the expressions of people's personas. And then you're going to be voting based upon, oh, this is what is needed or what people want from their society. I'm going to put my boat based upon that rather than the actual like person behind all these things that are going out because everything that you see is yeah, just yeah. The, the most extreme examples and, and, and the, the, the false, false masks that people are putting on about themselves and their situations yeah. things like that. Cause, cause the consequence to go against the persona of the public good is horrific. The media can destroy you within mm -hmm. a day. Um, through by even just taking innocent things and then twisting it, um, you know, in ways that that are egregious to you know what the persona is that the public expect from you. So, but if you then get in the business then of no longer you know considering integrity to be where you have one persona that persona matches you as a person, and instead you get in the business of separating those concerns where you manifest and cultivate multiple personas to the public good of who you're currently communicating to, then you deploy a mass success without um, the, yeah, without victim, or what is it, without witch hunts of your character. Um, so this is what every president does. What they're doing is they're manifest, or any celebrity, any person of celebrity is only able to be a celebrity because they're cultivating personas of what they determine other people want. Say, say that last part. So, again. Sorry, I was distracted. Yeah. So any celebrity is, is cultivating a persona to what other people want. That's the only way right. that they can become a celebrity to so many people. So this is presidents, actors, actresses, politicians. Um, so, and then this also is where democracy comes in, which is that you know, to go, so that, you know, it's also the, the thing which people say, there's no point voting for independence because it's inconsequential, right? Mm -hmm. So you must, it is a request to submit to what you consider the public good to be. It's, it's a tool of submission. 
um, that's that's the the proposition there, which is really interesting. Yeah. So, I, I mean, there's a way in which I guess voting third party is, I guess, a bit of a protest, maybe. Like, while I could have voted for or against, uh, like, for one of these two primary party candidates. I'm instead going to be voting for this other thing that isn't going to go through just as kind of like a fuck you <laughs> to, to the people that have been put up as the uh, primary no nominees up there. Right. Just, uh, but yeah, yeah. That, I mean, like that's kind of the thing when, when you don't have the power to change things, all you have is kind of the power to protest. And, and yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of all. That yeah. So, say. so, a democracy, the voting in democracy isn't dissimilar to the Chinese uh, propaganda inside the, the re-education camps where they get you to first write a letter of what's good about China and then they'll, um, you know, do that on the loudspeaker. So that's when you now have a persona that you have to cultivate to the perceived public good. Uh, so it's the same thing with a democracy, which is by casting that vote, um, you're actually... Uh, submitting to your perception of what is good for the public. Um, it's uh, yeah, at least that's the, mm -hmm. the theory. I need to work on it a bit more, but it's it's really interesting. It's funny. Just the other day, I had kind of like a complete turnaround in thinking about the Chinese social credit program. Because prior to that, I was very much like kind of oh, this is 1984. People need their their privacy and all that, but. Just the other day I was walking out around in the city because it was nice out and just was utterly dismayed with how much litter is just on the sides of the roads. And I was thinking like, man, if there were cameras that were tracking every time somebody was littering and then they were somehow socially punished for that, that, that might be nice. That way we're not getting all these just garbage all over the side of the road. It's like, I, I, I might actually like support the uh, social credit uh, control in regards to littering. Uh, that's something I, I might be okay with. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but but I, the, uh, the problem is that it's a power structure and the power structure tends to be used for more yeah, than yeah. just- It's not like that's the only purpose. thing it's gonna be used for, yeah. Yeah, that's the big problem yeah. with it. Um, yeah. I, man, I don't like litter. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some yeah. other alternative that could work around it, but. Yeah. Well, one of the funny things is like in Bali, right, in a lot of the developing world, they don't have um, trash systems. So like in Bali, people complain about the litter and they'll be like, oh, the Bali needs litter all the time. Is that sometimes they litter, but a lot of the times, um, well, it's actually here in, in Malaysia, um, a lot of the time it is, you know, people will put things in the bin, but the bins don't have lids. So then dogs and birds will get in the bins and then spread the mess everywhere. Hmm. Um, that seems to be unique to Malaysia. But in Bali, they would burn the trash and then people would be like, oh, how are they burning the trash? It's bad for the atmosphere and stuff. We'll be like, well, they don't have anything else to do. <laughs> like that's, that's the garbage disposal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Mm. It was something I was hearing about, uh, yeah. like, able to burn trash in order to create energy. <laughs> I think they're doing that in, like, Sweden or something like that. Maybe that'll be the, <laughs> the next step that we'll be able to, to work on, it's to be able to <laughs> do the kind of, like, what, what's the uh, Mr. Fusion, I think it's from uh, Back to the Future, <laughs> where you just can throw in banana peels and eggshells and just whatever <laughs> trash in, into it and then be able to run your, your DeLorean. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So I'm thinking about how this debate with you, Ben, uh, whether or not it, it actually like provided me any insight into whether or not I should uh, do the conversation with Ask Yourself and, and Adam. Because the way in which you argue is very, very different from the ways in which a lot of the uh, vegans kind of argue. They, they, they're very much focused mostly upon sentience and quality of life, where you're focused primarily upon liberty of the animal or the humans. And, and uh, Yeah, well, that's what I mean, which is if they're going to focus on sentience, you just invoke, you know, other areas where we should discard sentience. 
Uh, so, for instance, the, the sentience is a, is a dodgy line because then you're invoking, you know, other moral debates such as, you know, euthanasia or, or, or um, abortion. And should we even be aborting live babies, like, if, you know, post-birth babies? You know, to what degree do they possess sentience? Um, what about the mentally handicapped? It's just a, a, you know, what about oysters and mussels? What about insects? It's, it's a can of worms that is just useless in the vegan debate. It's that people hold on to it because they haven't thought it through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's something I was thinking about, like, if sentience is our, like, I don't know, inhibiting factor for what we consider things to be, actions to be moral or immoral, then what kind of like logically concludes from that is the act of necrophilia is an amoral action because it is not the harming or lowering of well-being for any sentient creature. In fact, it's the positive uh, of well-being for the necrophiliac. Same for possibly uh, having sex with people in comas. Uh, But uh, uh, I I think I've heard them argue before that uh, that's a harming of the well-being of the woman in a coma because she has to go through pregnancy while she's in a coma. But I guess if you're doing it with protection, maybe <laughs> that, then that... Uh, yeah, but even still, you could just come on a face, right? Like, who cares? Yeah. It's like coming on a face doesn't transmit any disease. <laughs> so... Right. And so, uh, yeah. yeah, I guess by pointing out that there are certain things that are immoral that do not fit within their framework of sentience or well-being, then this is an indication that they're operating off of an incomplete theory for morality. But of course, yeah, I, I, yeah it, and it seems like their typical response to that is to just reject the th- other things that I'm bringing up, like coming on, on the... Uh, uh, paralytics or not the paralytic but the the person in a comatose state space is an amoral act like it doesn't have any immoral qualities to it when for anybody watching that that would say like oh my gosh this guy is a psychopath so i don't know yeah yeah Yeah. if i wanted to that that might be a way in which to challenge their their worldview yeah oh i mean as well just abortion like Mm -hmm. you know abortion uh yeah, yeah. It there's is, this debate that tricky one for them. Hunter, uh, yeah, Hunter Avalon debated vegan games on abortion, and, and it's kind of surprising because, like, I guess vegan games says that um, what was the term? Uh, it, it, the uh, oh, that there's this like aquatic kind of like coral-like creature that. It, fits within our moral consideration for animals. And so like, you shouldn't even kill and eat, eat, eat them. Uh, but yet he wouldn't ha- place that same amount of consideration upon the, the fetus as it's yeah. developing. Yeah, th- this is what, this is, as I told you, like so many vegans pissed the shit out of me. Uh, like they annoy me incredibly. Like the, the whole sentience thing is just fraught with, uh, inconsistency and it also just seems to me like another act of self-righteousness it is I get to be the arbiter of sentience mm-hmm. and to me this is problematic do you want to go into a little bit what how you see, how how it is that you view objectivism uh, anti-abortion and veganism as all part of the same connected worldview because from like like I had said in chat, you're the only person that I know that's like that because from the objectivists I know, they're both carnists primarily and they're also pro-choice primarily. The same for vegans. They are anti-objectivism because it's selfish egoism when they're more focused upon utilitarianism or um, uh, yeah. altruism. And they're also, what's yeah. the other one? Uh, the, yeah, uh, but I, I mean, I know. Because it's n- pro-women's n- rights. Not, yeah. But neither of us is saying that people in general are consistent. And this this is the thing, like, I I really think, uh, unlike most people, I actually have a consistent uh, framework. And I think most people are just operating on on rough edges. And so, yeah, so for libertarianism, objectivism, veganism, and what's the other one? Uh, 
Well, I, that's yeah, the thing. I, I consider those... objectivism and libertarianism kind of as the same thing. Uh, just because like, if well, you're no, an objectivist, so, you're also well, in a libertarian. No, nah, so, well, Ayn Rand, she... Um, she separated objectivism in her, her non-fiction writing from libertarianism. So objectivism is purely that an objective truth exists and we should find it. Um, and then, but inevitably, uh, she then, you know, uses her fiction to also argue for libertarianism um, objectively. So she uses the philosophy of objectivism to argue um, for libertarianism, and that's why she can declare libertarianism as superior, because it's objectively superior. And whereas uh, her criticism against, you know, arguments against things is because uh, you need objectivism to be able to say your philosophy is superior. Otherwise, you're in the realm of postmodernism where everything is equal. Um, so that's that's she kind of even considered objectivism to be the more um, important philosophy than libertarianism is it actually allows people to concretely say this is better. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, and that's where she rejected, um, uh, who was it? Uh, Kant, because uh, she wrote Kant, uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's the same type of self-righteous utilitarianism where at the end it's saying my reason is superior, therefore I'm right. Uh, rather than actually finding out what is true. And that's you know, like a battle of reason isn't a battle of truth. It's just a battle of, uh, of, of um, righteousness, um, it seems. So, so all of these things, so if we say, okay, so first is an objective truth. So let's measure what's objectively true uh, or you know, and universally true. Um, so that would be that living things... Uh, have a will to live. That is why they are not killing themselves. They will to live. They have volition. They have, uh, you know, will. They have things that are on the end of enjoyment or, you know, or, or joy, and then things that are on the era of terror. So one is fleeing. So even like for, you know, fleeing defense, um, things that, you know, it's trying to then move away from and then things that it's trying to move towards, which is uh, the joyful spectrum. So then if we're going to think, you know, as an individualist or libertarian, we're about respecting individual rights. Um, and if we then acknowledge what the distinction between humans and like say monkeys or any living life is, the foundation is we're living. And from there, we have to acknowledge, well, it's, it, the same rules that apply for each person also applies across species, um, even into the plant kingdom to an extent. But at the same time, we have to have a consistent framework um, for how to relate to this. So that is the, the avoiding, unnecess avoiding necessary suffering. Um, so, yeah, sorry. Avoiding, yeah, avoiding necessary, necessary or suffering. Unnecessary. Yeah. Well, avoiding unnecessary suffering to okay. make it unnecessary. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Because that way, yeah, it can actually, you know, we can then be consistent in times where we need to induce suffering. And that's also consistent with how governments justify war. It's how we, you know, if one tribe is starving, it then justifies the invasion of the other tribe. Um, and or in the slaughter of the other tribe. And, you know, this is the same relationship that we have with animals. It's the same relationship that we had with other, other I wasn't going to say species of human, but races of human, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, where, when we actually did consider them different species, right? And then at the end, we've considered them different races, which is it's, at the end, it's like this empathetic boundary of expanding it beyond... Um, it's a self-interest or self-righteous into a respect of life and a respect for individuality and then a, a desire to promote freedom. So that's like, you know, for a libertarian, it's about liberty. And yet there's no reason why we should constrain that uh, specifically to humans uh, because the reason why we believe it to be the case, why we should even have it for humans should also apply to any creature that expresses will and experiences, you know, terror to joy or, you know, 
a, a yeah, a volitional agency. Um, so that's to me, like that's the unifying framework there. Like, I, and when people start quibbling over sentience, it, uh, it just wastes uh, time. It, it just seems like they're picking and choosing and uh, like, yeah, it, it's also just when, I don't know, like I think that's also what can get them so worked up about different issues is because everything's, uh, you know, holding by, uh, by straws for them uh, or they're grasping at straws to justify their faith-based axioms because they're not using objectivism. They're just, you know, finding some little arguments that they have a, uh, what is it, a, a pet, their pet, their pet project arguments. What's the... Like their pet ideology. The analogy and one? Yeah, their pet ideology, right? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, yeah, so it's the same thing for abortion. Like the reason why we're against abortion is because it violates the liberty of an individual. Uh, and why that exact same thing, it, it's, so that's the same reason why a vegan would be against, you know, slaughtering a lamb. It's a violation of the liberty of a individual, but at times it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we should seek to make it unnecessary. From the pro-choice advocate, though, they would argue that the child's existence is in violation of the woman's liberty, like their ability to, say, yeah. live live their life in, in, in such a way that they, like, that's the thing. If, if you're pregnant, then you kind of have to, like, take time off of work, and you have to take time out of the sexual market. Uh, there's a lot of yeah, things yeah, that you're having but, to but sacrifice. It... Sure, by that but if they're going to raise that argument, it, it doesn't matter whether it's a fetus or it's born. The argument still applies. It's still a creature parasitizing the parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder why it is that they still make An that. argument is against just... responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and like, I agree with that. I wonder why it is that then that some objectivists are... are uh, like make that arbitrary point between um, the uh, the is it just the fact that like once it's outside the womb it's actually visible and it's like something that you can't stomach yeah well kill? yeah was, well, well I mean plenty of mothers kill their babies it's, yeah it's yeah that's the thing because like in, yeah, in, in <laughs> like, ancient Rome that was the way in which like the the fathers would yeah. take out the child that they couldn't afford just throw them yeah. off the cliff. And it's about it, even with mothers, like if a sudden infant death syndrome is usually the mother killing the child, except we don't say it that it's the mother killing the child because it's, uh, it's not socially, uh, uh, what would you call it, conducive to acknowledge that. Um, so the, uh, yeah, it, it's... Yeah, just it's, a bit of... Oh, yeah, just... Yeah, it, I, I think it's the same like sleight of hand and like was well, specifically the smoke and mirrors, which allows factory farming uh, or even moist killing, which is like yeah. we pay other people to, you know, enslave and torture the animals. So we don't have to. Yeah. And just so that we can do that. For it. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing. Like we wouldn't hold a gun to someone to get them to pay taxes. And so we get someone else to do it. Right. So all of these things, like, uh, and so in the GitHub note, like, it's the same thing. Like, we use meat instead of flesh, right? We use all sorts of uh, little ways to equivocate ourselves away from things that would be uncomfortable hmm. for us to not have to face. And, and or rather, it's also, you know, the powers that be do the equivocations to keep us sheep. Uh, like, like we're not the ones who are deciding to use meat or flesh. It's the, you know, the society that markets it mm. as meat instead of flesh. Uh, so it's the same thing, I think, for abortion. Like, killing the alive child is different than, you know, going yeah. under and then, Terminating you know, the fetus uh, kind of the waking fetus. up without a, without a fetus anymore, right? Yeah. I just, sorry. Just, uh, what is yeah. it, the, the George or Orwell Newspeak? The, the way, or yeah, maybe that's not the like, way. yeah. So, like in, um, yeah, that's also why a lot of right wingers they focus on the videos of the process of killing the child. Uh, mm -hmm. The movie *Nymphomaniac*, uh, the woman performs an abortion because the psychologist rejected her ability to do it. They felt she was being brash, 
Um, mm. However, she did not want a child, so she did it by the coat hanger method, and it, the movie shows it explicitly. And she's mm. de detailing it to the amoral postmodernist, mm. and the amoral postmodernist uh, is saying, well, you shouldn't go into this detail because it threatens the right of abortion to those who need it in the developing world. And then she's like, well, oh, which again is like this, this utilitarian self-righteousness, like, because my reasoning, I get to take away freedoms of those I disagree with, um, which is being the fetus. But the, uh, but she then retorts back and it's like, well, regardless, one should be aware of the costs. Mm -hmm. And if we obfuscate and play smoke and mirrors around the costs, uh, then we're not being honest with ourselves. And so she's saying like, we need to know the cost and the immorality of it, but still have to acknowledge that it's necessary under specific instances. We shouldn't just say it's moral. Like this, so this is the thing I go into that Medium blog post. People have an unbelievably fucking hard time realizing that they are impure or that they have been impure. They want and they long for the belief that they are pure. Right, and this is like the like why carnists, or you know, not, yeah, carnists don't go into veganism or ve why vegetarians. They do not want to acknowledge that they have been impure, and it's the same thing where uh, for like maybe the vegan who wants to play the sentience game because then they can justify other things that may have them be impure. But if you you know if you go down this consistent route of of respecting individuals and the freedom, then it, it removes that ability where it's like, okay, you, you repent for the impurity of your, uh, your pre previous aggressions um, kind of thing, be it bullying other humans or, or, you know, questionable things in a sexual relationship or be it, you know, the slaughter of animals for your nutrition. And then you can move on to something where you don't have to, uh, you know, do all this psychological uh, uh, what would you call it? Um, Retaining ignorance for what you've done. Uh, no, what, what's the word? It's like, uh, like, like uh, hopscotch. Like, yeah, psychological hopscotch. That's not what I'm wanting, but it. <laughs> but do you see what I mean? Uh, uh, yeah, to to be able to just like to always make yourself be perceived as pure. Whereas if they do something consistent like this, then I can acknowledge like, okay, the time I ate chicken, right? Or, you know, at a Balinese ceremony or the time I ate fish when I was invited to a Balinese fishing village, right? With an impoverished family of the fishermen, right? These are times where I've committed something that was an offense, a violation of someone's agency. I participated uh, uh, by a, a third degree, uh, like a... a external degree to that killing of the animal um, and however it was necessary and people do not like to ever admit that they participated in harm they want to view themselves as uh, and this is why I get along better with meat eaters because at least meat eaters acknowledge that they're harming animals when vegetarians do not admit that a vegetarian will go to any end to justify themselves as righteous and they do not engage with it. Yeah, so uh, from my interactions with you, you like I, I recognize that I was harming animals by eating meat, but I guess I hadn't really thought about what I, I'm doing in, in drinking milk, in, in that it's the removal of the calf from the mother. Uh, it's like there's that bond already there that would be traumatizing for both of them. Um, yeah, it's something that to deeply consider really yeah yeah milk is uh it, like vegetarianism is way more extreme like in terms of suffering than uh than meat eating like meat eating is generally a free life until the day of end right whereas milk and eggs is an entire life of enslavement and suffering and it is uh it's it's how vegetarians justify it. It, it. I think the it's purely that a vegetarian sees meat and the meat is embodied as harm. It's it's someone is on their plate. Yeah. Whereas an egg or milk isn't someone. 
Yeah. Instead, it's someone in a beyond their their immediate perception is being. Uh, yeah, because that's the thing. Like for milk and eggs, that can be taken from the animal without them dying through the act. So, and, and that's the thing. Like, I, I, I've been around people that have raised chickens, and I, I, of course, it's going to be completely different from factory farming. But it, the way it's like the, the chickens are laying the eggs, no matter what. It, it's just whether or not they're going to be, uh, you know. <laughs> Fertilize and, and, and hatch, which actually requires more, uh, yeah, fo focus on that. But um, yeah, the, the living circumstances of factory farm chickens is really, yeah, unbearable. Yeah, but one of the worst things is the reason they put them in cages, because if they are uh, on free roaming, a chicken only has like a social group of like 10 other chickens or a dozen other chickens. Mm -hmm. And so they need to establish a pecking order. But mm -hmm. if they're paired with a thousand, they don't have the capacity to establish a pecking order. So they peck each other to, to detriment and death. So that is the reason why it goes, they're, they're put in cages. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the free roaming, uh, eggs are not your uh, your little farmers thing of a dozen chickens. It's like a thousand chickens all killing each other. Mm. So yeah, I think I've seen some of the videos of like just like the entire ground is covered with live chickens just moving around. It's pretty crazy, just all within a enclosed barn. It's, yeah, it's, uh, there there ha has been like for for the small town farmer that has like five or 10 chickens that they they just use for eggs for themselves. There's a way in which you can ha create these like mobile cages where it's like a, what, 15 by 15 kind of rolling chicken wire fence, closed off area so that no other animals can come in. So that each, the chickens can like focus on one part of the property at a time without like wrecking the entire area, but just like focusing, killing all the bugs within this area uh, and, and then moving the cage uh, over what, like 15 feet so they get to interact with the other area but yeah it's it's still a exploitation of the chickens but i i'm not so sure if it's a mutual exploitation there because the chickens are able to live in existence where they're not having to worry about predators and they're able to spread their genes forward into time and they're able to have, at least within that circumstance, some sort of social relationship okay. between their, their, uh, yeah. But to, to some extent, what gives humans the right to then dictate that relationship to the chickens, right? Like, like, is it our responsibility to take any animal and then make sure that they're being provided, you know, this, this comfort exists, yeah, this existence of comfort, um, because well, it, you know, for chickens, one thing, like, it's impossible. Uh, like, we don't have the capability yeah. of doing so. Just as yeah, for one thing, yeah. So, so you know, for chickens, like they got by fine uh, without human intervention. But the other issue, specifically with chickens, is it's very similar to the bee situation of taking the honey, mm -hmm. um, which is it has a cost to the chickens. So, chicken, like laying an egg every day, is costful. The if you take them every day the chicken actually statistically will produce more eggs than if they did it. It's not always a once per day situation and producing an egg is always quite intensive for the chicken and the chicken would actually eat the unfertilized eggs in a natural environment to replenish this nutrition. Right. Yeah. Uh, Cause within an, uh, a natural environment, they wouldn't have as much access to the resources necessary for survival. And so like eating an unfertilized egg, would provide that nourishment where otherwise it would require a lot of expenditure of energy to find it elsewhere. But yeah, that's the thing when living yeah. within a domesticated environment, the, there's that's, no, you, there's no like yeah. having to worry about the future for the chicken or, right. of course, I, I doubt that animals we, actually kind of have that worry for the future, but, but still like yeah. not having to at least Plus, expend energy yeah. towards finding food. Yeah. 
Plus, we also have the issue of a a selectively bred existence, which doesn't which which doesn't align. Like, so is selectively breeding for whom? For the dog's happiness? Are we selecting the the breeding the dogs to be the happiest dogs in the world? Are we selectively breeding the dogs to serve our needs as a human better? Are we breeding them to be completely incompetent and yet cute, like a chihuahua from a wolf? Right, like we haven't made a dog that is happier. We made a dog that is terrified, has anxiety, but is cute it, yeah. because it, it has a small dog syndrome. It's the same thing for a chicken. We breed chickens to be the largest they possibly can be to as lay as many eggs as possible. Sometimes they can't even stand up because they, they're selectively bred to be so big. For yeah. cows, we selectively breed the ones that produce the most milk to where uh, it can induce a ton of pain to the actual cow that they're producing so much milk. Um, so there's, yeah, it, it, it's, I mean, you know, for humans, we would selectively breed humans to a, a, a more happy situation where they're bred to be happier, where they're bred to have less suicide. But we're not breeding these animals to serve their needs. We're breeding them to serve ours. All right. So... Yeah. If I was to talk to Ask Yourself on Adam's channel, I, I, I'm not even so sure how much we would even get into veganism because uh, while he himself is a vegan, and that's kind of this, the main focus of his channel, when he was discuss yeah. what he was talking about with Adam Friended was objective morality and kind of like having a basis for objective morality being an atheist uh, as Adam is. Um, and so they kind of got hung up on like, uh, like Adam wants to consider the, his position that morality is objective because it has the objective evolutionary results to them to, to like, okay. Uh, like one of the things that they were talking about was uh, a monogamous society is better than a uh, po polygamous society because a monogamous society has is uh you know, distributes the, the, the mates of, across the population better than a right. polygamous society does. Um, well, that, this, is, this is not the case in hunter-gatherer communities. In hunter-gatherer communities, a polygamous society is better. Uh, right. It also may be the case in warring times. So, for instance, in the times mm -hmm. of Genghis Khan, yeah. that like is in a, a way in times that of scarcity strategy. where Yeah, where in the times of scarcity where most of the men have gone off to war and died, then yeah, probably yeah. polygamous you, would yeah. be kind yeah. of... You want the most successful mate to be re reproducing with all the women. The most I've heard successful some, man to reproduce with all uh, the women. polyamory uh, people speaking about how it might be that like on Mars, that would be a condition where polygamy would be a better, uh, better application for a mate strategy. Just because you wouldn't have to have as many men to send up there and provide for in like the time of scarce resources and uh, time. So like, it might be better to send up 12 guy, girls to every guy uh, <laughs> so, so that they could repopulate well, the area. Well, you don't even need polygyny. You just need prostitution. Uh, that would still be kind of like polygyny. Oh, right. well, well, actually it depends. Why, why polygyny is multiple wives. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, whereas the, I, if you just do polyamory, uh, like well, polyamory is both sides. So yeah. Yeah. But specifically it's the same thing, like with the war in Japan, how they use, uh, Chinese as well as Japanese prostitutions to keep the, the men warring and obedient. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, maybe prostitution is actually the tool of conquest. <laughs> right, right. Anyway, the conversation that they were going into in, in, in the video right. was to do in regards to American society. So, like, Adam wanted to say that it is an objective fact regarding American society that uh, uh, monogamy is better than polygamy because polygam uh, monogamy within this, I guess, environmental niche is more evolutionary success, evolutionarily successful. And uh, th Ask yeah. Yourself was kind of going up against that by what, saying well, that. Wait, 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 it, 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 it still depends on to what end, right? Like, because both are evolutionary successful, it depends on what you're, what's, well, how you're defining success here. So for instance, Tinder is the reestablishment of 
uh, polyamory within Western society and Tinder is exploding. Like it has taken over the females. Uh, and this is a reestablishment of where the winner takes all women, the male winner takes all the women. And so, yeah, Tinder is a situation where the top 10% get access to all the women. And the uh, and then the remaining men are competing for the women that the top ten percent didn't even bother with or didn't even consider. Uh, so this is a reestablishment of that. However, societally, if you're looking for sustainable societal development, it is bad because it demotivates the majority of men and it creates intergender competition, which is a waste of productivity. Right. Intergender c- competition is a complete waste of productivity. Right. And, and that's like, I, I think where Adam was kind of, kind of failing a little bit and, and like part of like what I said in the comment on the video was to do with like, okay, you can say that it's better for society. you just have to focus on like what, what is meant by the definition of society. So if society is a group of people that have a close cohesion and interaction with each other, that's able to sustain itself across time, then yes, from that definition, uh, monogamy is better for society because polygamy is something that uh, d- doesn't uh, like makes a society weaken and fracture and not capable, uh, not as capable at, at sustaining itself across time. So just by having an understanding of what the, the term itself that you're referring to is and saying that uh, monogamy is better for society, having a term for society, we can make kind of an objective Uh, understanding to say that uh, monogamy is better for for it Um, yeah yeah so for like a objective morality it depends always on the context that you're invoking the morality right but uh, the context is hopefully long-term and sustainable and universal right but it also depends right because you know 400 gatherers that's not universal but it, it, I guess, is universal across time, uh, and but within that specific context, right? So, you, so the opposite of a objective morality uh, is generally probably going to be nihilism, where there is no point, mm-hmm. um, or maybe, uh, yeah, or self righteousness. Um, but self righteousness uh, is dangerous because, just like the French revolutions, it can it perpetuates revolution. Right. And it uh, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, and, and that's the thing. Uh, ask even yourself. Motivate the individual. Ask yourself: Is like a moral nihilist in the sense that there is no objective, I don't know, property of the universe that makes things better or worse? Because I, I think that probably lends itself too much into theism. But more of a value subjectivist, where things are better, uh, things are according to a person's preferences as. That, and that's all that they are. So like if somebody has a preference right. more towards one thing, then that's how something is better based upon their preferences rather than some uh, objective nature to re- reality. But what you brought up there about how like trying to find a morality that's long-term and universally applicable and, and able to sustain itself, that, that works really great because ask yourself is all about, even though uh, morality is subjectively based, you can test it based upon its consistency. So it may be using his principle of consistency as kind of a um, pseudo, uh, uh, (laughs) using the the principles of long-term sustainability and universal applicability as a version of his, his a principle of consistency. So like you, like I already understand that he wants to build up a morale or an ethical system that is consistent within itself. And so having the understanding of say, uh, ought implies can. So in order for something to be morally, um, more, uh, or actually no, in order to have an ethical principle that is, um, able to be consistent across time. It has to be a, a principle that is able to be applied across time. So like, this is something I actually got into a, in a previous debate, like my first debate on, a, uh, on a, the uh, modern day debate channel about objective uh, value. That was kind of what the debate was about. But I, I was arguing that if 
you make a moral statement that cannot be acted upon, then it is a false statement. So like if I say the sun shouldn't rise tomorrow, but that's the thing, I, I can't control the, the rotation of the earth. That, that's something outside my control. So I cannot say that what my statement there is a um, true moral statement that I made or yeah, yeah, a true moral statement that I made. Now, that also kind of raises up an objection to Adam because he's saying that monogamy is a better or like we should have a monogamous society. Um, considering the fact that he doesn't have the power to control wow. the, the relationships of everyone within a society. Uh, right. Yeah. He can say it, but it's, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, I guess, true well, is, using well, my framework. I, I, I mean, unless the utilitarian communists get the way, in which case they will engineer the sexes of the society to reduce the, you know, to create design in men and make the majority of women. Right. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. While yeah, people so, have freedom, then, uh, yeah. uh, then it's probably a better idea to do monogamy. But if one can, like, this is the danger of utilitarian. It doesn't give a shit about the individual. It proclaims it gives a shit about the individual, but it doesn't. <laughs> it, uh, it just cares about the aggregate individual, which doesn't exist. And so it's willing to, to oppress and kill individuals for this aggregate individual. And it's just because some people consider it better. So yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. That was a, like the, the other brave thing. new world is yeah. in a situation where, you know, everything is optimized for the aggregate mm -hmm. at the wayside of the individual. It's like the utilitarian utopia. Yeah, that's a fascinating thing about the book is Aldous Huxley actually like creates a feasible utopia that like this would like satisfy all the ideas of like, and that, that's the thing, like when you first read it, you had mentioned Except how like, this sounds like a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's a, yeah, it, it, it doesn't have meaning and it doesn't have the ability to, I don't know, exist outside of itself. Like uh, if an asteroid were to land on, on Earth, they'd have nothing that they would be able to do to uh, withstand that. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's like it's a um, uh, what is it? it yeah, it, it's true. What it, it's is it a priority? It's true within it of itself, or it's true in of itself? Uh, um, it's like um, what is it true? It's true by definition. So. Uh, no, like it requires circular reasoning to make itself true. Uh, oh, so it's okay. true yeah, yeah. in of itself. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, so that's kind of like the Brave New World situation because it's only through its perspective of looking at itself, it's true. It's not true from, you know, alternative ways of, anal of analysis. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at it in through of utilitarian well-being or the utilitarian framework, it's true. If you're looking at it in terms of um, what we call it, uh, free will, is it true? Is it true in regards to freedom if everyone's life is predetermined to be aimless? Mm -hmm. um, is it true in terms of what is best for the human species in the long term? Um, like what, which, yeah, which God are you going to use to define its version of true? Yeah. So uh, just from this discussion, I recognize there's another element that like Isaac asked yourself, kept on doing during the conversation with Adam was that when Adam would make a evaluative claim, such as like, okay, it's better for society. Monogamy is better for society than po polygamy. Uh, Isaac kept on shifting that claim into a normative one. So rather than an evaluative one to say that we should make society monogamous, which mm -hmm. it, it, it's, I don't know if it's exactly cons uh, equivalent really. Like certainly you could say we should do what's best for society and, and then 
do that sort of uh, tra uh, translation of evaluative well, claim well, into a normative one. But that doesn't right. mean that it's uh, like, I, I think Adams is making a much more, not subtle, uh, less right. uh, less bold claim than uh, he, ask yourself kept on trying to translate it into. Yeah. Well, it's also a hard, right? Because like, who's the we there in terms of the we should, who's the enforcer? Right. And it's, uh, it's dangerous as well, because if you're going to interfere, then was your interference better than letting it, uh, you know, letting the morality self emerge in that community? Uh, because, you know, if everyone's perishing from the consequences of polyan, yeah, poly uh, polyamory, Mm -hmm. uh, then maybe they will stumble across monogamy themselves. However, like, so this is also, also one of the issues with, um, I found even with my own argumentation, uh, you know, the more you study philosophy, the more you have answers to more things. Uh, and you can very much become someone who is arguing from a perspective, you know, everything. And it's quite dangerous because you always have to be, actually arguing as if you're ready for surprise at any time and welcoming surprise. You should be arguing to welcome surprise. And that is very hard to do. And it's also uh, difficult. So for instance, I was out at dinner uh, last night and, you know, I was giving my theories upon all sorts of things. And, um, you know, I realized, you know, if you're more agreeable and you're more weak willed and less assertive, then someone like myself or even you, John, would appear to be dominating and um, aggressive in our conversational style. Mm -hmm. uh, and that doesn't leave room for the weaker and yet, you know, highly intelligent people to contribute things that could surprise us. And that's, uh, it's, it's quite dangerous, but it goes for the central planner as well is to, you know, offer a centrally planned policy, it reduces the ability for them to be surprised by deviations in the theory. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, this has been a, a, a good conversation. Uh, how, how long did it last? Because we, we started around five o'clock in it, so that, what, what, four and a half hours? Actually, no, yeah. there's a bit of time, so maybe more like four hours. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm glad I recorded uh, it. So, so I think I yeah, back over it at some point. Yeah, well, we could edit out the more private uh, topics of this that were, you know, tangential, and then upload it to YouTube. Because if I'm the only person who who is saying what I'm saying, then uh, then that is quite a, you know, by by economic standard, <laughs> then that's that is uh, a, a, a striking goal. Mm -hmm. so, plus, plus I, I think it was pretty fascinating to hear an actual like conversation about veganism from two different perspectives without actually kind of the, the moral fagging back and forth between each other <laughs> yeah but it, in terms of veganism like you're not going to to win uh against veganism but you can hope to destroy people's pathetic arguments for why veganism is better <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. I'll, I'll stop the recording then, and then, yeah, I can edit it. All right.